Hello and welcome to the sixth in our series um, on AI neuroscience and architecture. Today I'm delighted to have Jeff Hawkins with us, a very special guest, uh, the author of the book A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. Before I introduce uh, Jeff, let me just simply say a few words about, first of all, this, 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 uh, this course itself and also about our aims and then what we're doing this week. Um, so first of all, this is this is something that is part of the Digital Futures Initiative, uh, the idea of somehow of, of uh, spreading educational ideas for free across the world in order to make these important ideas available to everyone, any, anywhere, irrespective of their economic background, where they come from, and so on. Um, this is a particular series which is which is looking at what I see as um, uh, an emerging theory of uh, of of intelligence that's coming out of the interface between AI, neuroscience, and architecture. Just to mention that this uh, next week we we also have a session that's coming up um, on Saturday uh, on uh, a, a, a tutorial on form finding digital fabrication and I'll be sharing the links to this um, in the uh, the YouTube uh, live stream as well for registration um, that'll be uh, happening on Saturday um, and then uh, all these all these sessions um, um, in, including today's session uh, will be uploaded to the Digital Futures Library. Uh, I've put the link in there if you can get a screen capture so you catch it. Um, and this is these the two series that, that I want to refer to at the moment. There are a lot of things that we have there, especially on tutorials on AI and so on. But this particular series, uh, AI, Neuroscience and Architecture, is up here uh, on, in, the, in the list. And also the series that happened last semester on architecture and philosophy, also a very successful series. They're also to be found here. Um, and I encourage you to not only have a look at this, but also to pass on those links. Um, so this is now um, uh, the, 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 the sixth in the series. Um, and uh, uh, we now have, we, we almost have completed got the, the schedule together. I haven't been able to get hold of Antonio to, to, to get Antonio Tomasio to confirm a particular time and a date because it wouldn't, he couldn't make the date that we had available. We will sort that out. But from, from now on, we, we now have two more. We have two sessions that are looking particularly at architecture. Um, Wan Yu Her, um, AI and Architecture, and Daniel Bolojan looking at AI and creativity. Before we move on to Susan, Sh Susan Schneider, who is uh, the NASA, um, uh, the, uh, NASA uh, philosopher and also um, uh, a scientist of, 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 let's say, AI and consciousness. Um, and we follow up with Andy Clark, Surfing Uncertainty, who was his himself has himself collaborated with David Chalmers, someone we had early on in the series. What we're getting then is this uh, a really interesting sort of series of positions that all relate to the other in some way, although they don't necessarily overlap completely, they're not identical. But out of that, we're getting a constellation of different viewpoints that collectively, collectively are kind of giving us a sense of a new kind of theoretical debate emerging um, uh, at the intersection of all these disciplines, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, and today it's, 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 it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Jeff, because Jeff is possibly the one person who actually is explicit about this. He's actually calling his work a, a theory of intellig intelligence, um, and uh, he's therefore central to all the debates that we're, we're, we're going to come up with. Um, and Jeff himself is somebody who uh, has, has quite, had quite a colorful and distinguished career. He started off as a student at Cornell, read electrical engineering, went on to uh, to uh, how, it, it, intention intending to do a, a PhD at Berkeley on the neocortex, nobody could supervise him, but nonetheless, that became part of his lifelong mission to go and research the neocortex. Um, uh, online, you can uh, he's he, in, in in the process since what he's doing been doing uh, uh, since then and what he's doing now, which is uh, running an organization called Numenta. He has done a number of different things, including um, inventing Palm Pilot and so on. He's been a very successful um, entrepreneur and inventor. Um, and this is something I think I find really interesting about this particular series is not only are we getting a kind of the world of arts and science coming together, the world of philosophy and, and the world of, of, of AI and, and neuroscience, but also we're getting the commercial world, uh, the world uh, where uh, uh, with, with the academic world. And that's that's extraordinary. Blaise Aguiriakos, of course, is with Google um, and uh, Yosha Bach is working with Intel and so on. So we have a kind of very interesting intersection of all these things coming together. Um, if you want to find out more about Jeff, there's a lot of it online. Um, he has, in particular, uh, these two um, interview, uh, interviews with Lex Friedman. I like the idea of round two. It sounds like it was a boxing match, uh, Jeff. But, uh, <laughs> but well, actually, I, I have to say, I really appreciate Lex's work. He's, it's, he's been laying the foundations of something astonishing. Um, 
Jeff is responsible for these two books. I mean, in between, of course, there have been a huge number of uh, peer-reviewed uh, uh, papers and journals and so on. Uh, and but these two particular books uh, on intelligence, which I know has had a huge influence on some of our um, our, our readers, which he, he, he uh, co-wrote with Sandra Blackley, and then and that was in 2004, I think. And then in 2021, a thousand brains, a new theory of intelligence, which I'm not even going to attempt to to introduce, but is is I think a, a really groundbreaking book um, and one that I think does a huge service by laying out some of these uh, often complex ideas, but in a very accessible and well-written way. Um, I want to say, first of all, before I do introduce Jeff, is, is that I, as a writer, I really admire uh, this particular book. Being able to uh, articulate complex ideas in a simple way is a particular skill. Uh, in Jeff, in architecture, we have a thing called minimalism, a style, a way of doing things called minimalism which makes these buildings look very clean and precise and, and, and seemingly effortless. But the point about minimalism is that actually you have to work very hard to make it look effortless. And this book, <laughs> I, can, I can tell you, I know as a writer, to make it look so effortless, you have to work very hard. So it's an extremely accessible book. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, 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 stop sharing and, and say, welcome, Jeff. It's fantastic. Thank you for coming along so early on the morning um it's uh, it's uh, it, jeff is in san francisco where it or just above san, san francisco where it is just gone seven o'clock in the morning so thank you so much for coming coming along and the way that we'll operate today is is uh, i would like to invite jeff to say a, just a few overviews of the words overview of the book itself and then i'm going to start off with some questions in a kind of let's say a, a, more, a kind of lex friedman style shall we say me asking the starting it off and then we're going to open up to questions uh, from both the Zoom audience and also from uh, the live stream audience. Um, so, Jeff, welcome, welcome. Uh, uh, maybe I could just invite you then, just for those of who are unfamiliar with the book uh, and unfamiliar with the Lex Friedman interview, just to, interviews, just to say a few words, just to give an overall view about this book. I mean, I could try myself, but I'm sure you could do it far better than me. So, uh, welcome, Jeff. Uh, well, thanks, Neil. It's a pleasure to be here, <clears throat> and um, I appreciate you inviting me to be part of the, uh, this conversation, and I appreciate what you are doing with your work on these conversations. So uh, I think sharing knowledge and ideas around the world is really, really important, um, and it's one of the motivations for me writing a book that I did. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, I'll, I'll tell you just briefly about the book, but I think the context of the book is early on in my life, uh, in my early 20s, um, I decided that um, understanding how the brain works was the most important things that we, most important thing humans could do. It's a, in some sense, the most important scientific problem of all time. Everything we do, whether it's architecture or philosophy or engineering or, or running a restaurant, it doesn't matter. It's all done by brains. And all the, all the good things and the bad things that humans do um, are caused by brains. And so uh, this seemed to me, in fact, we are defined by our brains, what makes us as unique as a species. And so understanding how the brain works seems paramount to understanding humanity and understanding our future and controlling the future. Um, so um, of course the brain is a very complex organ, um, but it can be understood. Um, you know, we've, we've tackled other very complex things. Think about what we've done with biochemistry, DNA and RNA and so on. And so it felt to me in my lifetime, we could figure out how the brain works and um, I also felt very early on that uh, doing so would also um, give us key insights into how uh, to build intelligent machines. And that, in fact, I felt that then, and I feel now that our AI is very primitive. It's not really intelligent at all. And studying the brain will help us figure that out. So that, that's the context that I basically de de dedicated my life to this task. Um, and, um, and so my re the recent book, A Thousand Brains, um, it was, uh, I wrote it because uh, we've made significant progress in understanding how, what it means to think, what it means to have knowledge in your head, um, how we understand the world. I mean, progress in, in very detailed neuroscience ways, like, you know, what are these cells actually doing? <laughs> uh, how does this happen? Um, we haven't figured it all out yet, but we've made significant progress. And I felt it was worth, uh, uh, definitely worth a book to do that. So on intelligence um, basically lays out, the, it's, you can think of it as in three parts. The first part lays out um, the problem, why it's important to understand the brain. And, and then I walk through a series of discoveries that have been made uh, by myself and my team and others um, to sort of lay out what the big picture is, like what's going on in your head. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, 
But I think it's something architects can relate to because what essentially the brain does is builds a model of the world in your head. And just like architects build models, uh, physical models, computer models, similar, something similar to that. So I, in that first part of the book, I lay this out and the thousand brains refers to the theory. Uh, one of the attributes of the theory is that we don't have a single model of the world in our head. We have thousands of them. They're complementary and they work together. So that was something that was surprising. The second part of the book talks about the impacts of brain theory on AI. And I think um, artificial intelligence is very early, uh, despite all the late and recent progress, it's nothing close to what it's going to be in the, in the near term future. And, um, and I think brain theory is going to play a huge part in that. And so I make the case for that in the second part of the book and talk about uh, the risks and, the, and the, the opportunities associated with very, very intelligent machines. And then the third part of the book I put in, um, it was questionable whether I should write it at all because it was slightly off topic, but not quite. It was, I basically talk about the future of humanity in the context of uh, understanding what intelligence is or what understanding us ourselves as an intelligent species. What should we be striving for um, in, the, in like the very largest picture one can imagine um, about what's the future of humanity and what should, what should our goal be uh, in, the, in the universe, how to think about that as, a, as an intelligent species. So that's really three parts. Um, I say the first part, theory, and the neuroscience is about 40% of the book. So it's, it's the core of the book. Um, so uh, that's in a nutshell. I appreciate your comments about the readability. Uh, it, it is a lot of work to write a book. Uh, <laughs> in the sense of anyone who's written like this will tell you they, they have to write, like, write it like three times. That book has been written like three times. You throw things away and you write it again. You throw things away. Trying to make it easy to understand. Um, and hopefully uh, I've achieved that uh, for some readers. So that uh, is in a nutshell of the book, you know? Yes. I, I mean, I, I've, I must say I've read it. And, and what came across, I mean, it is a, a singly very um, architectural book in some strange ways. I don't know whether you, you're aware of that. But I mean, first of all, the idea that we're living in a simulation, um, that itself has been some of the things, we've, one of the things we've been discussed in some senses all during this series. And, and that is, is so interesting to the whole discourse of simulation and virtual reality and so on that is fundamentally part of, 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 um, of, the, uh, of the architectural discourse. Um, the also, I think the idea that, there, that we are modeling I mean that is that is also intriguing. Um, I mean, I, I the, the idea that we've got a model of the brain or models of the brain in my in, in my head. Actually, curious. Models of the models of the world in your head. Models of the world, exactly. Sorry, yeah. In your brain, yeah. I have to say that independently, I'd come across as, as a thought to myself, and, and you know, it always struck me as strange when you would um, you know someone have a haircut or they dye their hair or something, and you'd notice it. And in order to notice it, you 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 had to know what it was like beforehand. So. I came up with this theory. This is crazy. We've got we've got this whole view of the world that we record somewhere in our brain, which is remarkable. And, and then you obviously talk about that, which is which is incredibly interesting. Um, so there are many things that are very um, architectural about it in some senses. But one thing I find <clears throat> maybe particularly interesting is is the way that you describe things, because I mean, apart from the model and models and so on, which of course and modeling as well, there's a process which is fundamental to the way that we in architecture operate. Um, apart from the fact that, that, we, that, that you mentioned that, you also, I've not I noticed, come up with a series of observations um, which are uh, quintessentially, um, I don't like what I call it architectural so much, but quintessentially uh, about a, a kind of three-dimensional world in some senses. I mean, you talk about your coffee cup, you pick up a top yeah. cup, you talk about bottles of water with Lex Friedman and so on, about the physicality of that sort of world. You also talk in, <clears throat> about... Um, Buildings a lot, actually, strangely. Uh, that's what I found. You were talking about the interiors of spaces and, and chairs and so on. Then you were talking about mapping, which, of course, again, is a fundamentally architectural uh, um, uh, uh, concern. Mapping itself and then using examples of, 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 of maps of cities and cutting them up and so on. So there's a it, 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 throughout this, there's a very, very strong, um, <clears throat> to my mind, architectural sort of uh, way of thinking or a, a way of thinking, which is a uh, a very three to three dimensional in some senses way of thinking that yeah well i think i mean that comes partly from uh my engineering background um and um i'm i'm not an architect but i've designed many things including multiple homes um and uh so uh, these ideas are, are are sort of embedded in me um but i think they're very very helpful because i mean it, it's 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 really incredible that we learn these, we basically have sort of, it's almost the equivalent of a CAD model in your head. You know what I'm saying? It's like, 
you you know the shape and structure of so many things and where they are and the relationships. And as you point out, we know that we know this because we're constantly, if anything's changed or anything's different, we notice it. So that means that we have this model in our head. It's constantly making predictions about everything. I mean, you touch the texture of something and what it feels like, what shape is, where it is, how people are going to react. And it's an incredibly detailed model. Um, and so you have to ask, and it's in some sense, we, we know many things which we can describe as three-dimensional um, and, you know, art, artifacts in our life uh, that we interact with. And um, so how does the brain store that information? Uh, how does it learn it? What is the structure of its of that knowledge inside? How do, how do cells do this? And so it's very helpful to think about things like architectural or, or three-dimensional or CAD models, things like that, as, a, as an analogy. Um, uh, of course, the brain does it in a slightly different way. And we actually have a pretty good idea, a very good idea, how the brain is actually doing this right now. But it's... Um, but it is, I think there is a lot of overlap because architects try to imagine the future. They try to build things they try to visualize things before they build them. Um, in some sense, um, they live in these models when they build things, um, and in, whether it's in your head or on paper or on a computer. Um, and, and the brain does that too. So uh, the brain just does it in a different way, but it's pretty fascinating uh, that that's how, that we have this incredibly rich model of the world in our head. Um, and very, you know, we spend, a, my team, we spend a huge amount of time trying to understand exactly how that model is built. Uh, most neuroscientists don't do that. Um, some do, but most don't. They're, most neuroscientists are in more detailed uh, parts of the brain. But, um, but it's, a, it's, it's an area that we're making good progress on, uh, really good progress. Perhaps, Jeff, you could just say something about the thousand brains themselves as a kind of concept for those. Yeah, sure. Um, Again, I said earlier, this is something that was surprising to me when we came across it. Um, so the idea that the brain has a model of the world is not new. Um, a lot of people have reached this conclusion over the years. Um, and um, so that's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a surprising conclusion, but a lot of, it's, it's not new. It's been around for, for, for years or a few decades. Um, what was surprising to us in, is that we realized that that model is distributed in many, many different places. Um, so I, I, if I can, I'll just paint a little picture of the neocortex for you, okay? Um, so uh, the neocortex is about 70% of the volume of uh, everyone's brain. And it's a sheet of neural tissue. It's about two and a half millimeters thick and about 1500 square centimeters, um, which is about the size of a large dinner napkin. So you can imagine the sheet of cells. It's, when I say it's a sheet, it's got, you know, it's very, even though it's two and a half millimeters thick, there's a lot of neurons in that two and a half millimeters thickness. Anyway, that sheet of cells is remarkably, at different parts do different things. There's, it's, it, it fits in your head and gets all crumpled up. That's why it's wrinkly up there, but it's still a sheet. And it's divided into these, um, these what are called cortical columns, uh, which are very small. They're like the size of a grain of rice stacked next to each other. There's about 150,000 of them uh, in there. And um, anyway, different parts of the neocortex do different things, but but the architecture, the underlying neural architecture looks remarkably the same everywhere. Uh, remarkably the same. Like you can't even, you know, sometimes you can't tell what part of the brain it's, you know, if this part's doing vision or hearing or touch or mathematics, they look the same or, or different species of mammals, they all look the same. So there, there was speculated many years ago by a, a man named Vernon Mountcastle that um, these different parts of the brain all work on the same principles that hearing and vision and touch are actually the same. And um, all you have to do is you put some, plug in some eyes in the part of the neocortex, it becomes vision, you plug in touch, it becomes a touch and so on. So this is sort of a background idea that's been going around in neuroscience for, for decades. And um, what we realized is that every one of those cortical columns, every one of those 150,000 uh, units in the neocortex are actually complete modeling systems. Um, they, each one takes some input from someplace and builds structured models from it. Um, that is, if the input changes over time, and, and these models um, know how the sensors are moving, uh, so they combine movement of your sensors with sensory input in some sense, and they build structured models. So if I ask myself, well, where's my knowledge of a coffee cup? Well, there are parts of my cortex that receive touch input, and they can model what a coffee cup feels like. They, they can learn the structure of the coffee cup through touch. And if, if I have uh, other columns that are getting input from my eyes, they see the coffee cup and they can learn models of what the coffee cup looks like. And they can learn the three-dimensional structure of the coffee cup through vision. These models are not identical um, because they're the different modalities and different parts of your body and, and eyes and so on, but they're complementary. 
And so if we ask ourselves, like, where is the model of a coffee cup in your head? It's not in one place, which is what most people would think. You'd say, oh, I have a model of a coffee cup someplace and it's stored in this place in the brain. It's not true. Um, it's stored in, in many, many different locations. Um, um, and each of these models are complementary. They're not, they're not copies. They're not um, identical. They're, uh, they're not clones of each other. They're different. And just like a model of touch, you can learn a model of coffee cup through touch and a model of coffee cup through vision. Um, they are they are complementary and different, and they work together. And they they vote in some sense. They have these long range connections where they come to an agreement. It's like a bunch of people observing something from different directions, and they say, "Well, what can we all agree upon?" And they all say, "Well, we all think this is the same thing. It's a coffee cup." So that's where the idea of the thousand brains came from, because it, it's really it's more like one hundred fifty thousand brains, <laughs> but. Not every one of these columns is learning everything. That's not, of course not true, but uh, many of them learn um, any particular thing you know is stored in many different models. And this is one of the reasons why if you have brain trauma, you know, you don't forget everything. If, you know, if I lost my sight, I still know what a coffee cup is and how it feels like, right? <laughs> it didn't, I didn't lose that because it's stored in other parts of the brain too. So that's the gist of the thousand brains theory. Um, uh, but that's, that was a good way of sort of uh, trying to catch people's attention about it. Thanks, Joe. The one, the one thing I think that that uh, maybe we should also just touch upon um, are reference frames, because that's also a very architectural perception, the idea that yeah. they're X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, whatever um, coordinates, and we're mapping them within a, that logic. Yeah, this was, this was a discovery that was made about 1990 um, by a, um, a lab, a couple called the Mosers. Um, and they discovered these cells in the brain, what are called grid cells. And they're in a, an older part of the brain called the entorhinal cortex. And um, grid cells look like they're kind of mapping out space like a reference frame. It's not an X, Y, Z type of reference frame, but these cells fire in, in sort of these patterns that sort of make a, uh, a grid, if you will, over some space that you're traveling in. And they clearly look like they're used for keeping track of where you are in space. Um, well, they are. We know that. They're, yeah. Now they're there. So this idea that there are reference frames in the brain is not new. Um, those red cells in the old part of the brain, these grid cells, are, are basically used to map out spaces that you might walk around in, like a room or an environment. Um, they kind of map that space so they keep track of where you are when you're walking around in a building, for example. Uh, these cells literally keep track of where you are if you walk around in a building. Um, um, but what we what we realize uh, or speculated first, but now there's a lot of evidence for it, is that these cells are throughout the entire neocortex. So every one of these columns I talked about earlier, uh, we postulated they would also have grid cells because we realized that that the brain has to make build maps of everything, uh, not just rooms, but coffee cups and buildings and you know computers and thoughts, and and so the, we we said well this is, it's going to use the same mechanism for this. Um, so there's this idea. So we propose that every one of these these columns, every one of these models in your head has a reference frame. Um, it turns out they're going to be built with grid cells, but that doesn't matter, matter too much. It's a reference frame. And so literally, when you learn a model of a coffee cup, you're literally, the brain, the cells are really figuring out, okay, at this location, these are the features that exist here. And then these are in relative position to these features. And, these, and so you're building up this sort of three-dimensional uh, CAD-like model in your head, and, and many of them at the same time. Um, uh, and so the best way to call them is reference frames. A lot of lay people don't know what a reference frame is, so I had to explain what that is. Um, but um, I'm sure architects all know what reference frames are. <laughs> so um, so it's, a, it's a good analogy. Um, it turns out, again, the brain doesn't do things the way we do in computers. So it isn't numbers along in X, Y, and the Z axes, um, but it achieves the same result in, a very, in some surprising, uh, clever ways the brain does that. No, it, again, this is this is so architectural. The idea of a model, the idea of all these reference frames, and so on. Um, I, I just want to kind of comment that, that, that I think architects are, are interesting, and maybe the engineers and, and product designers are probably the same in some ways. In that we tend to th we tend to sort of um, turn things into form. We have this. Uh, we we read some a book on French philosophy. We see the term deconstruction, and somehow we imagine something to do with construction, or we read. Gilles Deleuze, who's talking about the fold, which is actually a, a philosophical thought, and we translate that into folded forms and so on and so on, which is a, in some senses a weakness, but at the same time, it's a very special aspect of being an architect. And we also have the capacity to visualize things. We always diagram things. We lay out two-dimensional diagrams as a way of thinking, which is 
I think unusual um, compared to philosophers. But the one question that I that I have is is uh, and it's it doesn't it's not for architects so much, but but when it comes to reference frames, when you're dealing with things that are less about form and more about information, um, so yeah. you're dealing with a, a philosophical concept, how yeah. how can you work within the reference frame for those? Yeah, things? yeah. So so th that's a great question and. And so again, the architecture of the brain suggests that the same mechanisms we use to learn the architectural form of something or the form of a building, a form of a coffee cup, seems to be playing in other parts of the brain that are doing mathematics and philosophy. I mean, it's the same neural tissue. It doesn't look different over there, right? So this led to us thinking about this, and I have a whole chapter in, in the book about this, about, um, you know, about concepts and high-level thought and how that plays out into this art idea. And um, the evidence is very strongly suggesting, and I, I'm certain it's, it's right, that, that we, see, we use the same mechanism for organizing all thought. Now, a couple of caveats there. Um, um, the brain doesn't have to work in three dimensions. Uh, I mean, a brain can learn three-dimensional structures, but um, as far as we can tell right now, it, it's not restricted to three-dimensional structures. But what, what, is it, what is it doing? Imagine you can have a reference frame. Um, you're, imagine the following, uh, that you have a space, you can think of it as a 3D space, but it could be a, a higher dimensional space. It doesn't really matter. It's the same idea. Um, and what you're doing is you're actually storing um, knowledge at locations in that space. Uh, you're storing information at, space with that, at locations in the space. Imagine, imagine I ask you, you have knowledge about your house. Let's go back to houses again. Imagine you have knowledge about your house, and I would ask you, well, what's in your house? Well, you can't just tell me all at once. What do you do? You mentally walk through your house, right? You mentally, visually, you go, oh, I go into this room. I look left. I look right. I go this way. I open this drawer. And then, then all of a sudden, the idea of what is stored in the locations comes to you. In some sense, you have to, you have this information stored in some sort of hierarchy of reference frames, and you have to navigate physically or mentally to get to that. And that's what happens when we think about anything, mathematics or philosophy. We store knowledge in, in these reference frames. We're not aware of it. Um, but you can't think of it all at once. You, you, you sort of walk through this space mentally. You, you traverse it one idea after another. What links, one thing links to another, links to another. And um, in the same way that you can recall information in your house, I ask you, oh, tell me about David Hume and what do you know about him? You sort of walk through pieces one at a time to get there. Um, there's also this interesting component of this is that uh, the brain works through movement. So we learn by moving. We learn by moving our fingers and touching things, by moving our eyes and walking around. It's essential. You can't not learn without moving. It is core. It's like you move and, and you have to know where you are in your reference frames by moving. And then you can say, what is there? Um, and when we, when we recall things, like I mentioned, walking through your house, you mentally move like, okay, I'm going to walk in the door, turn right, turn left, go into the bathroom, things like that. Um, but you can, um, we do the same thing when we're thinking about abstract thought. Um, movements may not be something physical at this point, right? If I'm doing, if I'm in mathematics, I'm thinking about something in mathematics, a movement may be doing some mathematical transform or mathematical uh, function, which says, oh, if I'm here and I do this function, then I should be at this location. Um, and so it, it's a little bit, you know, we don't understand it completely. We understand the modeling the world pretty well, but modeling things like philosophy and mathematics, but it's very clear that we do this. Um, that we're using the same mechanisms to sort of map out and, and store knowledge about higher level thoughts and concepts. Um, it's really all the same thing. It's reference frames, it's storing knowledge in reference frames, it's accessing it by some form of movement, whether that movement is physical, or if it's, I uh, mean, you know, like it could be, you can translate to something physical, like, like imagine walking, or it could be something like a mathematical transform. It doesn't really matter. It's a, the same basic idea um, so we're, we're approaching sort of a unified theory of what it means to know anything, conceptual knowledge and uh, physical knowledge about the world. But I find that I find that very exciting. So, Jeff, I mean, just one quick question. I, when I was as I was reading that, I was wondering and I've often thought about this myself, um, whether well, you give an example from from athletics from track and field. I used to be a, a track and field athlete. So I competed against Cornell in my days. So, um, 
but, uh, but well, I, I, I was struck by this. I mean, what I've often thought in, in, in terms of your, the, the example you, you talk about is runners lining up on, the, on the, the starting line ready for the gun. But the one that I found really interesting, I don't know if you ever noticed with high jumpers, um, when they're about to sort of take the jump, they're mentally going through all the processes in their mind. And you can see their body kind of, you know, doing it. And then they kind of like move their arms up to the jump and think. And it's really as though there's a kind of tool path diagram in your mind in this kind of this this framework you're following this kind of thing which is a mental path in some way does that is that is that a long way from what you're talking about well uh no officially a lot all athletes do that even if you watch the recent Olymp winter olympics you saw the skiers at the top of the slope they got their eyes closed and they're just they're they're, they're, walk, they're mentally going down the entire course um and it's been shown that mentally practicing something like that is pretty damn important. It works really well. <laughs> so you can do it. Um, uh, so uh, there's a couple of things here. The, the analogy I was using in the book about the runners on the starting line was about a different topic. I can talk about that if you want. Um, but uh, I do think this just just goes shows that we have this model in our head and the model, you know, if you're a, if you're a uh, high jumper or something like, right? well, you do that a lot. <laughs> so that you, you spend a lot of time thinking about that. And so, sure, you have this model of exactly how your body moves. And the model, you know, we, we have model are exact. We have, we learn all kinds of physical things we do that are very precise. And one example I use often is, is, is I notice that when I dry myself off after a shower, which is a very complex process, um, I do it almost exactly every, to the T every day. It's almost exactly the same. You grab the towel in the exact same spot, you're whipping around, do all these things. So we practice these, these physical movements and we learn them, these sequences of behaviors. Um, and so the brain has to store these, right? And how does it do that? We, you know, we spend a lot of time on that. Um, anyway, my point is that it, it's just the high jumper just has a model of what they typically do when they do the high jump. And they're practicing that model by mentally going through it. It turns out by mentally going through it is, is actually has a lot of benefits. Um, it has a lot of benefits as, as much as physically going through it. Um, so um, that that's a... That's all I can say about that, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. I, I just, just thinking about the, your your model of, of showering and, and always doing the same routines, as it were. Um, I, you know, I, I find that fascinating. And I, one of the examples that I've, I've given, and I've, I say, actually, in the end, we're not that creative because we tend to follow patterns. And the, the example I think of is, is a, a piece on a chessboard that only can move is constrained by, you know, its habits, shall we say, to only operate in a certain sort of way. We have signatures, the way we speak, yeah. or everything we do is like that. And, and it, so it, and it means that we're constrained. So for example, certain politicians, a bit like a pawn, they can't, they can't retract their statement, you know, they can't go backwards and things. <laughs> and that really constrains us. And I, uh, so, so I, and I want to just kind of lift, raise that question about these, the kind of, let's call them pathways of habit or something like that. And, how how does that would that relate say to when when I'm in, a, in walking through London say uh, I I used to arrive at King's Cross Station and I was teaching the architectural association I had a certain pathway I'd go through and it always struck me that that pathway there was also being etched into my uh, neurons and synapses the, the kind of pathway could you make that analogy or is it possible to sort of to see a link between those habits and kind of how do you well, explain well, everything is done by the neurons and the, and the synapses, right? To everything. I mean, our speech, there's everything. So, this, you know, we shouldn't be surprised by that. Um, I think what was it, what the story of me drying my towel, the path you take um, from, the, from the station, um, there's a couple of interesting uh, uh, parts about that. First of all, I, uh, we use the word sequences for those. Um, there's all kinds of sequences. Music is a type of sequence. Um, the, the, the way I, there's motor sequences, like how I, um, uh, dry myself off, and there's motor sequences how you, how you walk from the station and so on. And um, uh, obviously, it's it's efficient to not have to figure it out every time you walk from the station, right? <laughs> so, but but interesting, it's like it's a very complex sequence um, that we go through, um, and uh, and through our lives. In fact, most of our lives we're executing these motor sequences all the time. And my speech is a form of motor sequence, right? These are words I've spoken before and I have to do very complex patterns and the neurons are doing that. And I string together sentences that I've strung together before and they're really complex patterns. And um, so one of the reasons, one of the ways we studied the neuroscience of the brain was to ask how sequences are learned. And I wrote about this in the book. It was a way of attacking the problem of like, what's going on in the brain? 
because sequences are a type of model. It's a, a very specific, a, a melody is a type of model. It's a very linear time-based model where most of the models we are in the world are not like that. But we, we started, uh, studied how to, how could learn those sequences? How can learn neurons learn these very complex sequences, which are made up of elements that are repeating, you know, um, like if you're following a path, you might turn left and right and straight and left and right and straight, whatever. But those elements are repeated in different places. You don't get confused. Or a melody may have a passage that repeats in different places, but you don't get confused where you are in the melody. And so the, you can, we studied this in great detail. We published a paper on this uh, <clears throat> in 2010, I think it was, about um, how sequences are learned in the brain. Um, anyway, I think it's it's just part of, you know, you every almost anything you can bring up you know, <clears throat> is something the brain does. And, um, and so these are all clues as to how to decipher what it's doing and how it does it. Um, but I think sequence memory is, uh, is, is one of the key things that we use to, to um, sort of crack the code, if you will, uh, of what's going on in the brain. Um, I, I might have rambled from where your comment was. No, I mean, no, I'm no, not no. sure what the original question was. I kind of forgot it now. No, 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 no that's, that's fine. No, no, okay. But let me just take this. This is more from a personal perspective. Because at one point, I, I have had a discussion with with a colleague who's actually in the chat today, um, uh, Daniel Bolajad, uh, about you know what we do that we're conscious of and what we do that we're not conscious of. And somewhere, yeah, I came across a comment about the fact that because there's almost like a, a level of, of 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 information that's going on that we're not aware of. I mean, the body sort of somehow filters or edits out things, and we if we had to deal with all the information, we become overloaded. And you had a comment somewhere about how we filter out or block or something, or we don't have access to all our, all our, our processes. Was, do you remember that at all? Well, that's certainly true. I mean, um, if you think about um, the neurons in your head and there's in the neocortex is around 18 billion, maybe no one really knows, but that's, that's the latest guess. Um, and uh, they're firing on and off, they're spiking and doing those activity. Uh, this is a, that's a huge number. <laughs> um, most of the activity in your brain you're not aware of. You're just not aware of it, um, meaning consciously aware of it. You can't talk about it. You can't remember it. You can't express it in any way. A simple example is when you look out at the world all the time, anytime you're awake, pretty much, uh, your eyes are uh, moving rapidly. Um, they're called saccades. They move around three to five times every second. Uh, they go this, bing, 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 bing. If you look at someone's eyes, you'll see them doing that. Um, when that happens, the input to the brain changes completely. I mean, the, there's an optic nerve, which has about a million fibers on it. And whatever's on that optic nerve completely changes, different pattern coming in. And you're generally not aware of it at all. Um, the world seems stable to you. You're, you're looking at a, a building and it just says, there it is. <laughs> it's not moving around, it's not jumping around. And so that tells you right away that there's a, there's a good, Billions of neurons that are changing their activity all the time, and you're not aware of them at all. Yet, somehow, you're aware of some stable percept. Um, but that's going to be represented by neurons, too. So there's going to be some neurons that are stable, that, that meaning the activity on them is not changing. Some are going to be firing, some are not going to be firing. And there's going to be a whole bunch of other neurons that are going on and off, on and off. Um, so we're generally not aware of uh, most of what's going on in the brain. We're not aware of most of what we're doing, of how the, we're not aware of the processes underlying how thought occurs. None of this is, is accessible to, uh, to our, our speech or our long-term memory or short, you know, our, our episodic memory. Um, uh, so that, I think that's a, an interesting thing. And also, um, uh, you know, we're, we're not only we're not aware of the changes that are going on, but, you know, we, going back to earlier, we're talking about the model. We, we, what we perceive is the model and the model could be right or wrong. Um, um, and so our perceptions of the world are not really the way the world is. Uh, our perceptions of the world are what we think the world is going to be based on previous experience. Um, it's a model of the world that we perceive. Um, you know, even something simple like color, you know, the color of an object, the color of, of a wall in a building, it's not a real physical property of the world. <laughs> it's, it's a made up property in your head. <laughs> and the physical property of the world is light has frequency. <laughs> and it's over a continuous spectrum of which we only sense a very small part of that spectrum. And we turn it into something called red, which doesn't really exist in the world. Um, you know, you can say a band of frequency of light, but red is not something that exists in the world. So that's part of our model of the world. And so um, it's a useful artifact uh, for how we understand the world. So I think this, this gets back to the question of, you know, Things going on in your brain, you're not, brain that you're not aware of are it's a fact. Uh, most of the activity in your brain you can't you can't be um, you can't be conscious of. Um, 
And, uh, and also that what you are conscious of um, is a model of the world and it can be wrong too. So, it's a, uh, but usually it's pretty good. <laughs> I've got, a, I, I, we've got some questions coming from the chat, but before we go into this, I've got maybe two or three more questions. I just wanted to, to probe that uh, uh, one is that, you know, I was, it was interesting because I was looking through your work and uh, there, as I say, there, there were, to, you, this is a very three-dimensional world that you kind of describe. It's an architecture or objects feature very, highly in it uh but what i was looking for was was maybe something about um about sort of comments about let's say um the, the aesthetics what, what i mean by this is is that you know when i uh i've got a friend who's an engineer and uh i mean he's from cambridge and he's now still there in cambridge in the science park and he's he he, he um he uh he he designs chips and and what's interesting is his concept of design is very different to an architectural concept of design for him to design a chip is really about making it efficient and you know very uh, you know a clever layout and so on and and, and it, so it works and, and so on and so on and so on and he doesn't <laughs> worry about what it looks like so much although i assume that a good chip is probably look, it looks good but but <laughs> you know, we, we have a different thing because we have a there are two things we're kind of balancing one is the kind of the strategic the logical the functional which is very much an engineering question you know buildings have to stand up they've got to work they've got to be they've got to sort of sit, sit in their site and god knows what else they've got to perform but then we, we have this kind of this aesthetic um, overlay if they've got to look nice as well they've got to look nice so when we say design we, we we don't just think about how a chip works it's really about what it looks like as well and when I went through your book, it was interesting because there were some obviously references to kind of those qualities and things. I mean, you describe a red fire engine and so on and things, uh, and you describe the logos and things and, and all this. Um, but no real comment about of what uh, would relevance or, or not of not of, of aesthetics of what it looks like. The one thing I did kind of pick up though was the word elegance appeared in your discourse. Um, <laughs> well, elegance is a word that scientists use all the time because. I mean, great theories are elegant, um, and and I think great architecture is elegant too. Now, what, what does elegant mean? Um, you know, elegance in a theory, elegance in mathematics or in science is is sort of the the simplest description that explains everything, right? Um, and so, if you would, I'm not an architect, and so you know, but if I would ask what's elegant in design of a um, you know, I used to design handheld computers, right? So what, what was an elegant sign? Well, it's sort of the simplest form that done everything that you wanted to do and, not, and no more, right? <laughs> and, so, um, it, and elegance is usually a good sign that your scientific theories are on the right track. Um, you can have a complex theory to explain something and, and an elegant theory, a simple theory. It's not always true, but um, so I think that's why I use the word elegant. In terms of aesthetics, that's a... That I, I really can't answer that too well. Um, I, I mean, it's not something I've thought about in terms of like the brain. First of all, I'm, I'm not sure it is a concrete thing. You know, one person's what you think might look good, may, someone else might like it's, it's certainly cultural and certainly something you've learned. You know, um, some people thought brutalism used, used to look great, man. Some people think it looks terrible. So, you know, who knows? <laughs> it's the eye, eye of the beholder. Um, um, so, but I, I don't know how to describe that other than. I think what the brain is constantly trying to do, and this is a sort of tangential relationship to your question, the brain is constantly, constantly trying to figure out a model that explains what it's sensing. And when you sense something that's very confusing and difficult and you don't understand it, like a scientific problem you're working on, and then you're able to, the brain is able to figure out a model for that and it explains all these things. It's a very pleasurable experience. This is the aha moment of, oh, I have a solution to this problem. I'm sure architects do this too, right? You also, you're struggling with something and then, oh, that's the answer and move this here or whatever. <laughs> um, and I think um, in some sense, that resolution of conflict into a model that explains it all is an aesthetic quality of, uh, is one type of aesthetic quality. It's a, it's a quality that says this is an elegant design because it it satisfies all these constraints and, ex and I can build a model of it. It's simple to understand. I remember we were talking earlier about a building on the MIT campus. I won't mention it by name unless you want to. Um, um, that uh, designed by a famous architect. And when I entered that building, um, I was totally confused. This is where I'm supposed to go. You know, which is up and which is down. Like, how do I get anywhere? It was like really confusing, you know. And so I would say that lost some aesthetic quality of elegance because, you know, I should be able to understand it. I mean, I walked into my models of buildings didn't work anymore. And, um, and so, 
you know, a, a good design of anything should be in some sense familiar in a way that you can say, hey, I understand this, I can interact with it. But then we also sort of, we have a built-in desire for a little bit of variation. I think the brain is also from an from a evolutionary point of view, it w- doesn't want to just sit in one place. It wants to explore and do new things. And so you always want to like move a little bit in some directions that, well, here's an area I hadn't been before. Uh, maybe it's a little dangerous. I don't know, but I'll try it out. So I think architecture and like any art is like that, right? You want it to be somewhat familiar, yet also sort of challenging and, and invoking new thoughts. It's like, oh, maybe, maybe I can figure this out. Like, we're, we're digressing very far from my, my area of expertise. I just want to warn you that, you know, this is a, you know, I, I live in the world of ne- neurons and synapses and, and brain structures. So, no, but it, you know, I, I, it's absolutely fascinating for, for me. I'm sure for all the audience as well. Let me just kind of make a comment, and that is to say, your the idea about disorientation um, uh, when you, you can't find your bearings in a space is actually quite famous in architectural discourse because of a cultural theorist called uh, Frederick Jameson who talks about an experience. Um, in the Bonaventure Hotel in, in LA. I don't know if you've ever been that building hotel, but it, you go into it and it's all very symmetrical and, and you get completely lost. You don't know where you are. And he has this notion of cognitive mapping about your, your capacity, the need to be able to find your bearings um, uh, in, in the life world, maybe not to the world. But, and, and so it's actually part of discourse. The idea of mapping and cognitive mapping is, is a- Yeah, yeah. Well, is that, was that building done on that way on purpose? They wanted to confuse you or is it, or is it just an unfortunate accident? <laughs> Uh, it was. I, I, it's an unfortunate accident. They, they, did, okay. they did try and rectify it by making, you know, putting in signs and allowing people to go and find their way and so on. Yeah, you, know, you know, if if, if neuroscientists really want, I mean, if uh, if architects really want to get into it, see, they do these experiments of rats all the time, where they put them in these environments and they try to they 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 explore what kind of signals you have to put in that environment so the rat knows where it is. Yeah, you know, and and they can confuse the rat to think it's in a different place and. I mean, th- th- this work I mentioned earlier about grid cells, this is how it's done. They take these rats and they, and they can tell when the animal recognizes its environment and maps it. And, and they can then change the environment so the animal gets confused. <laughs> so maybe architects are doing that on a, on a grand scale. <laughs> I, I, I've got, I want to move on to AI in a second, but, the, but, but just to give you a kind of comment, this is maybe, uh, and I'm still trying to get my head around it because I, a while back I was right, working on, on basically psychoanalysis and, and contemporary um, cultural philosophy. And I was using the term model and modeling because that was part of the discourse. And uh, let me just get, so give you some background to what, what I mean by that. And that's to say, uh, Freud starts talking about, about uh, the way in which we identify with the person. Uh, and particularly he's talking about in his book of jokes, he's talking about how do we identify with the person who is um, slipping over banana skin. And the way he puts it is you know, we have memories of slipping, maybe on ice, not a banana skin. We know what a banana skin is. And we somehow model ourselves on that person. And you know we can imagine what it is to slip over on, the, on a banana skin. Now he then makes this comment. He said, well, this has got huge aesthetic potential. And, and then there is, a, <laughs> there is, there is a, there's a, there's a, a philosopher called uh, Adorno, Theodore Adorno, who actually does that. And he says, and this is, I was intrigued by this because I was interested in how do we relate to identify with our buildings? And he makes this comment. He says, by means of the mimetic impulse, we, uh, it, we kind of like, we connect with our environment, we identify with our environment. So he makes it, and so he's looking at how do we, how do we connect? And, and I won't go into the long story about that, but it's kind of, a, it's, um, it's a bit like the logic of memes in some way. But what he, the point that he makes is that in order to connect in some way, uh, there has to be a, a form of sensuous correspondence. In other words, it's easier to connect with something that's well-designed and elegant because it, we can relate to it in a certain sort of way. So, and I don't know how that notion of the model and modeling connect, connects with yours at all, if at all, but it does speak. Oh, the social- I think it does. I think, I mean, like everything, according to our work in the, what I wrote in the book, everything in the, you know, every piece of knowledge, everything, every tidbit of anything you know is stored in a model and it's stored in reference frames. And so these mechanisms underlie everything. Um, there are parts of the brain that I'm not talking about, the emotional parts of the brain, for example, you know, something evokes fear or anger or, or, or desire. That's not what we're talking about. But in terms of your understanding space or understanding things or understanding ideas, um, those are all uh, built using the same mechanism. You know, and think about here, I didn't think about architects when I was writing the book, but I can see what your point. I think, I think you know, anyone who thinks about structure, design, um, how do I understand something? How do I know where I am? How do I know the affordances of something? Um, 
it, understanding how the brain builds models of the world would be helpful to you because that's what it's all about. Um, that's, that's what your brain does. It is a model building machine. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> and, um, that's what animals, you know, we, as, a, as soon as animals started moving around in the world, you know, instead of being a plant, uh, or just floating in the sea, as soon as they started having any kind of directed action, they need to start to have a model of the world. You, you can't move unless you have a model of something and like, where, which way should they move? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it can be very simple. And so this led this long series of progressions where we are today, where, Humans have created this incredible model of the world in our heads and things we've never seen, right? You know, and we have models of space. We have models of under the sea. I've never been there. I have models of city. I know things about cities that I've never been to. Um, uh, and, and you probably have uh, models of buildings you've never seen, um, you know? So and I think, I think this is a, you know, I, I'm trying to, I like our work to be transgressed from just being, hey, this is a neuroscience AI thing to like, no, this is a humanity thing. Um, and we are, we should all understand how our brains work. We should all understand how the biases we built into our models affect how we view the world. Um, and so that was one of my hopes in writing the book. Yeah, the, the, so the, the, the idea that somehow that you, so it's the idea is about assimilation, this, this model, how, you, how do we assimilate to the world? And I would just kind of throw out this idea that, you know, as we go through all these repetitive things that we do, our habits, you know, climb, the way we climb a staircase, the way we do certain things in certain spaces, it's through the repetition that we somehow can become attached to the space itself through the constant reiteration. That's, uh, that, that's, that would be the theoretical view. Well, maybe. I mean, I guess I've never thought of myself attached to a space, but sure. <laughs> I think the space suggests the affordances that you have, right? Um, you know, uh, I see something that if it looks like a staircase, then I mean to know that I might be able to walk up it. Um, if I see something that's familiar, you know, that looks like it might be a cup, then I immediately think I could put fluids in it and things like that, um, even if these are novel things I've never seen before. Um, so part of our work right now that I'm working on is it's literally how to how do these models, um, this, we're getting a little technical here, okay? So the, right now I'm working on how, we, we have a very good idea how these models are built using neurons and the structure of them. Um, we're now thinking about how does the model itself include the physical behaviors that you can interact with or the behaviors of the object itself. Think something like your smartphone. You know, you touch the screen and things happen, but you know what's gonna happen. You have expectations, you have a model of that thing, right? Or take like a door or a door handle. Well, you know, you could design a new door handle, but I should be able to look at it and figure out that I'm, how am I supposed to interact with that thing? Um, so these, the physical structure actually defines the, the, the behaviors that can be, it can exhibit or the behaviors of how I interact with it. Um, and that's all part of the same model. So this gets to the, uh, maybe it gets to the, you're talking about this attachment. When we see things we immediately know if we recognize it in any sense, we immediately know the things we can do with it because the model includes both of those things. It's not like I have a, uh, a model of a stapler that what it looks like. I have another model of the stapler, how it behaves. Um, they're one and the same. Uh, it's one and the same internal structural in the neurons uh, stored in the same structure. That's a bit uh, getting down the weeds there. <laughs> no, no, no. That, 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 like, I, I, we're getting a bunch of questions. I want to really I want to raise the question of AI because that that is a, a kind of um, an interest many people in, uh, here today is is AI. It's it's actually what I would say is actually we're a very special moment in terms of the the, the history of AI and architecture, and that suddenly AI is coming of age in a sense that the we have in the chat today, even in this the Zoom chat, we have I think the three the authors of the three first books on AI and architecture. Um, Wan Yu Ho is in China, Emmanuel Ko is in Singapore, and I'm, I wrote one too, um, and I've got another one coming out. In fact, the next, in the next few months, there are going to be five books coming out on AI and architecture, and it is really, it, we, it, it, and not only that, but actually the kind of work that's coming out is really reaching a standard that people are sitting up and paying attention to, that, that, that really it's, have, gonna have a, it's having a huge impact. And, uh, there are a couple of things that are about to about to be released that I know about um, designs which will really startle people, and uh, <clears throat> all of a sudden it's going to be what Kai Fu Lee calls the Sputnik moment, right? I mean, the, the idea is suddenly think, oh my God, is that what it can do? You know, and uh, so, but we actually curiously we have, we have in, in architecture we have a, a, a not the Sputnik moment. Um, this so just for those who don't know the Sputnik moment, it's, Kai Fu Lee describes the moment in, in the Alpha Go match. This. You know, famous kind of uh, the match itself largely has been a Sputnik moment because because China and 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 Korea 
uh, suddenly realized what you could do with AI. And, and, that, and, and as a result of that, uh, they started investing heavily in, in AI. So that's what Kaito Lee calls the Sputnik moment. In architecture, we have something which we would call the Bill Bauer effect, which refers to this architect, Frank Geary, who one of his more successful buildings, not the MIT building perhaps, but was, was a building in, in Bill Bauer it's for the Guggenheim Museum. And it was built in 1997, it was opened in 1997. It was kind of interesting because it was the first example of this seemingly outrageous um, kind of organic form of architecture that everyone had dismissed as being either you know, not buildable or, or not relevant, and it worked. It worked. It worked in the sense that it transformed the city of Bilbao. It became a huge attraction, a tourist attraction. To, to, and, and so it showed that architecture could transform a city. So we call, that's what we call this, we refer to that. And so I think now AI is about to hit that. People are thinking, oh my goodness, I always dismissed this, but now I can see what it can do. So we have, and then we have some people in the audience, two of them who, uh, who are very, very talented, well, several of them, very talented designers who are exploring that. I want to, so this is a kind of, to my mind, we are now approaching 2022, we are approaching that moment when AI is coming of age and it's absolutely incredible what's happening very quickly um, and so on. So anyway, what I wanted to just do on the subject of AI versus the brain, let me just, uh, I mean, everything I, you say I agree with completely, but there's one thing that I think I, I would take a different approach. So this is probably, and I'm just an architect, who am I? I mean, you can ignore that. but. I've always been looking, you, your model is basically to say that, that, that the AI doesn't have true intelligence, the, the human brain does, but the AI doesn't, which is fair enough. But I take the opposite view in a sense, I'm thinking, you know, um, maybe, just maybe AI can tell us something about who we are and how we operate in the mirror of AI, you know, we can maybe find out about ourselves, which is something that others have said as well. But what I mean by that is, is that I think if we judge things according to the human standard uh, and we know what we can do, then maybe AI will not meet that standard. But then I'm thinking about this, the, particularly this, this, this AlphaGo match and about the fact you, you probably know about this famous move 37 in game two, which nobody could understand. They, they, they thought this is a mistake. It's a mistake. But then it transpired. It was it was an act of sheer genius absolute genius and a hundred moves later, you know, AlphaGo wins the match and so on. And the problem is that we can't even conceptualize that level of strategic thinking. Um, well, all right. So, so I think you're, you're fooling yourself there a little bit in the sense that I don't think AlphaGo was doing any strategic thinking um, uh, in, in the way that most people would use those terms. Um, so let's just tease apart a few things you said there, Neil. First of all, I don't think humans are the gold standard in terms of what is intelligent. What my point is that humans learn very, very differently and they use different mechanisms than today's AI. I mean, completely different. It's not even close. Um, and, and, and today's AI is really good at some things, but it's really, really bad at other things. And, and so it's not like AI is bad or like this is bad. It's just, it's not. What what it, we were talking about early running models of the world and all the different types of models you can have. AlphaGo, if it has a model, it would be limited to Go. That would be it, and it doesn't even have the kind of model we're talking about. It's a very very sort of shallow model. It's just saying, you know, AlphaGo is basically saying, well, given this position, given the gazillion games I've played in the past, the next less move would be this. It's not thinking through a hundred steps at a time. It's not thinking strategically what's my opponent like or anything like that. It's really brute force. But brute force can be really great. It can really work well, but it's no thinking or planning or, you know, you, you can't ask AlphaGo, why, why did you do that move? It, it, there's nothing there to answer that question. It's just basically, in, in some sense, you can think of it this way. The, the number of possible moves in a Go game is, you know, gazillion, 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 right? You know, but in some sense, from a purely mathematical point of view, every position on the board has a next best move. And you can't, you can't ever list those moves, but in, in some abstract universe, that's true. And what, what today's uh, neural networks are really, really good at is approximating that. But they're not good at thinking about it. Now, where does, does it matter? If I wanted to play Go, no, I wouldn't. I think AlphaGo is going to beat any, the best thing to ever work like a brain ever. But if I wanted to um, so have somebody who really, really understands philosophy, or the example I use in the book 
you know, we accept that our, our robotic systems today are so weak, you know, but imagine I said, I want a system that goes out and, um, you know, designs, you know, design, interviews, interviews a client, figures out what they want in the building, then comes back and do several designs and present it to them. AI isn't like that. It's not even close to that. It's not, it's not even going to get there. It's, you know, you can, you can use it in narrow ways. Now, you've written a book about this. I don't know, uh, but maybe you'll disagree. But my point is it's that the world of how brains work, not what brains do, but how brains work is fundamentally different than how today's AI works. And both of those have their, tra tra their trajectories that they're going to go in the future. We're used to the way AI works, today, these neural networks. Um, they're really good at certain things, but they don't understand what they're doing. They don't generalize. They're really difficult to train. They have all these limitations. They're very brittle. Um, but none of those limitations apply to the way the brains learn. So it's a, just a fundamentally different way of learning. Here, here's one way to look at it. Brains learn by movement. They have to move through the world. You have to move your fingers to feel, you know what something feel, uh, you know what it feels like. You have to move your eyes to what it looks like. You have to move your head to hear how things sound. You have to walk through space to understand things. You have to manipulate things. There's no, almost nothing in AI works that way. So if there's a physicalness to the world and structure that you're dealing with, AIs can't deal with that. Um, they do it in a very, very shallow way. Um, it's a, it can fool humans to thinking that they know what to do, but they don't. Anyway, I'm not an anti-AI person. I'm just pointing out that we're, I, and I made the case for this in the book, we're going to build machines that, are that work on the same principles of the brain. Um, and I believe that will be the center of AI in the future, uh, not the technologies we have today. Um, and the, the, uh, the technologies we have today are gonna to stick around, but the in the future, when we think about really truly, you know, humans building intelligent machines, it's not gonna be built on today's technology. That's my argument. Yeah, no, okay. I guess the, the, the point that I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, machines don't think at all. I mean, I, they, they just they don't have that awareness. But but nonetheless, they have a capacity to operate. And I'm not even sure what what term we'd use. But uh, it, it, certainly, if you think about humans versus dogs, for example, you know, the, the range of hearing, the range of smell of a dog is far exceeds what humans can do. And I often think that however you describe what a computer can do, um, that we as humans, we've got to be careful, we have to go through what I would say a second Copernican revolution. And this is where I'm different. Okay? We're not the center of the universe. We've got to understand that maybe there are things that can do things, whatever the term would be, but not intelligence maybe, but they can do it beyond, we can't even understand it. You know, And if, if it can come up with a move that we can't understand, then we are limited by our, our own frame of reference. What we see is intelligence. Well, yeah, we might, again, it's, you know, we, you shouldn't be surprised by this, Neil. Computers today, computers over the last 40 years, outperform humans in all kinds of tasks, right? And, and that's because they're fast, they're, they, they're, they're internal processes. The silicon runs about, a, you know, a billion times faster than a neuron. Um, they are able to process huge amounts of data. And, um, and that's fine. I, this, and so we can't, I can't understand how my calculator does, you know, figures out the sign of a number so fast, right? <laughs> but it does. I don't, but I don't ascribe that to intelligence. I, you know, I can, I can understand what's going on there. What's happening here with the neural networks today is these are sort of, many of them are sort of black box. You can't figure out what they're doing because it, it's, it's just as, it's very difficult to know how they reached an answer. And so we, as humans, we might ascribe it to some brilliance. But I'm telling you, the, the, the move of AlphaGo is not, it's not brilliant at all. It's just this mapping of inputs to outputs, and it achieved it by great amounts of training. I mean, really amazing, you know, like incredible amounts of training where it's, these systems can tease out these statistical patterns, and yes, they'll be better than a human. But that, again, that AlphaGo system cannot understand what it's doing. It can't do anything else. It can't do anything else. I mean... You can't ask it a question like, you know, what time of the day is it? Or when did the game was played? Or you know, how does the game typically look like? I mean, there's no idea any of that stuff. Um, and so AI scientists realize these limitations. I'm not the only one saying this. The AI scientists realize these limitations. And many of the leading AI researchers today have said, we are going to have to come up with other technologies because what we're doing now is, is limited. And it fools you into thinking it's smart, but it's really, really limited. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean it's not really valuable. You know, maybe they'll come up with the most brilliant building design you ever heard of. And, you know, fine, I don't know. 
<laughs> but, but it's not going to design the building. We'll put it in the pipes and run all that stuff. You know, <laughs> it's just going to, you know, who knows what it'll do. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm still a believer. Uh, and there's nothing that's changed my mind about this, that we can build machines that work on the same principles as the brain. It doesn't mean we have the same sensors. It doesn't mean we have the neurons. None of that stuff. It's these principles of movement through learning through movement and building models. And those are the principles that matter. And we're going to build machines that do that really incredibly fast, incredibly high capacity. And those will be truly intelligent machines. There'll be no question about that. And they'll be able to tell you why they made that move and go. <laughs> no, okay. I mean, we've, we've got some, some AI experts in the, in the, in the, the chat who maybe we'll, we'll discuss this. Yeah, I, yeah, it's clearly uh, my opinion. I, I think, as I said, the idea that current AI is, is going to hit a wall is accepted by many, but not all, but many of the leading AI researchers. And then, um, I think the uh, I think the idea of something else is necessary is also very widely accepted, not by everybody. Um, and uh, we're, we're saying, hey, we think we figured out the key to this, um, uh, the mechanisms by how we're going to do that. That's all I'm claiming. Yeah. So uh, we've got, I want to now have open up to some questions that are coming from the chat. There are several questions, and some of that. Uh, you, uh, do you do you want to do you want to curate those questions or should yeah, I? Let me invite some people to ask them, and there are some that from from the Zoom chat, and maybe I can ask those on the Zoom chat to ask them in person, and some that are coming through YouTube, which I can I can read out. But let me first um, <clears throat> invite Mirich to um, to ask her question. Mirich is um, we, literally we were spanning the world today. Mirich is in Serbia, but she's doing a PhD in Shanghai remotely as it is because of because of COVID, uh, uh, as it were. Um, so, Mirich, would you like to um, ask your, your question? Thank you. Um, uh, so my question is, um, what is the relationship between the model of the world that the brain makes? And uh, can I say action or the realization of that model within the world? Uh, could you be, be a little more explicit what you mean by what's, you know, I'm trying to think, okay, the, the realization of that model, are you saying is the model accurate in your head? Is... Yes, how do we confront it with the exterior of the brain? How does it, I mean, if the model is a representation of something, it's always, um, it's not the same as the in architecture for example there's a difference in scale between what is yeah. built and what is made and then that scale invokes uh, a difference in style in representation and um, uh, many many other details are not the same as they would be in reality and so how does this model in our brain confront to this like how does it does it ever get out of our brain do we ever confront it with what's outside well, all the time, actually. Uh, so imagine, of course, the model in your brain was learned by observing the world. Now, we can't observe the entire world, right? We, we don't, and we don't have the senses to observe the entire world, and we don't physically observe the entire world. So our model of the world is a subset of the actual world. Um, it, you know, there's many things that exist in the world that we just, we, we don't understand, we have never sensed, we don't even know about, or, you know, they, and so on. So it, it's a subset of the world. It's generally pretty accurate. And here's how it works. The, when, the, when we go about the, our day, every moment of your waking life, your brain is predicting, uh, based on its model, what it's likely to sense, like what words I might like you to say next, or how I might behave, or how things in your house will be, or like I turn here, I should expect to see you at the door, and so on. And you're not even aware of these predictions, but the model is testing itself all the time. It's saying, okay, I'm expecting the model says this should be here. This door should be there. This should be here. I should find this in my cabinet. This is in the fridge, um, whatever. This is what Jeff's going to say next. Um, and, uh, and it's testing itself. And if something is different than it's expecting, um, then that's an opportunity for changing and modifying the model. So we're just doing this all the time. And if I if you put in architect's terms, if I walked into a building and there was something very unusual, maybe there was a window that was in the shape of, I don't know, a heart, whatever. You look at it, you go, that's unusual. I've never seen that before. Now you started adding to your world model that there can be windows that look like a heart. Um, so we're testing the model all the time. The model is a subset of the world. I also have a, a whole chapter in the book about how the models can be incorrect because much of what we know about the world, as humans know about the world, we've never sense directly. Um, we were just talking um, earlier about places like, like I have a model of, let's say, um, 
Manchester, England. I know something about it because my brother lives in there. Um, but I've never been there. So it could be completely false. I've never personally sensed it. But I have this model. And if, if what people told me about Manchester was wrong, I would have an incorrect model in my head. So it's very easy to form false models or false beliefs about the world for things you haven't personally experienced. You can't first personally see or touch or hear um, because you're relying on what other people tell you. And, and generally, those other people, there's a consistency to them, and it's, and it's good, but it can be wrong. So the point of all this is that the model is just a subset of the world. It's constantly testing itself, constantly, every time you're, you're awake, and it's updating itself constantly. But it's still a subset of the world, so it's not the complete world that we can understand. And the model itself can be false. Um, it can be incorrect based on, um, basically, information we receive from others that may be incorrect. Um, and we can't tell the difference that uh, if, if, if all the information we're getting from other people is incorrect, we cannot tell that that's incorrect. It's just, we'll just accept that it's true. So this is how the model interacts with the world. Uh, um, it's got its pluses and minuses, but it's, uh, again, it's not complete. It's not always accurate, uh, but it's always testing itself. And if I, I don't know if I tried, if I answered your question or not. In a way, it gives me a lot to think about. Thank you. Okay. So. <laughs> So, so, Jeff, we've got a question from Daniel Bolajan, who can't use his microphone, so I'm going to read it out for you. It's in the chat. Uh, thank you. And Daniel, I should say, is one of the, one of the one of the three or four leading AI architecture experts in the world. Uh, very talented individual. Uh, so, so he says, thank you, Jeff, for taking the time to be part of this discussion, and thank you for an amazing book! Exclamation uh, mark. Is the process now? His question is this: Is the process of creating a model of the world entirely a conscious process? Question mark. My understanding is that our brain models the world both consciously and unconsciously. Can you talk about the importance of our brain generating models of the world while we sleep, daydream, and hallucinate in brackets unconsciously, unconsciously, and the importance of generating models of the world consciously? Okay, so I, uh, uh, that's a great question. I, I'm going to try to tease it apart a couple of pieces into that. Um, conscious and unconscious could be like like. He suggested like sleeping and not sleeping, but I was originally thinking of something else. Um, so let me address the thing I was thinking first, and then I'll address this question secondly about consciousness. Um, I, I'm, I'm amazed that there's many things we know about the world that we can't express to people. Um, uh, that is, we know it, but we're, I, I can't consciously relate it to you. One of the simplest examples I give, uh, which shocks people sometimes, and maybe, maybe this won't catch architects, but when we, in, in, in the English language, the lowercase letter G is uh, printed in books in a certain way. Has a, the font, the letter G, has a certain look to it. Most people have read that millions of times, but most people cannot write that letter. Um, they write it the way they were taught in grade school, which is a circle with a little loop underneath it, but that's not how it's printed in books. It's there. So here's something you've seen millions of times, and most people say, like, yeah, I can't really think of what that is. So there's, some, there's knowledge that we have, tons of knowledge that we have. That's just a very simple example of things that we interact with the world, but we can't express it. We don't know it. We never consciously thought about it. Um, it's just there. And um, we might, well, even notice if it's wrong, but I can't access it. It's like, it's like that letter G. I can't really, I can't draw it. I don't really, you know, I can, but most people can't. Um, so there's that kind of conscious level of knowledge. It's something you've learned and experienced, but you can't, you don't know that you've learned it. Um, that we have a lot of that going on in our life. And, and so that's one type. I think the idea that learning when you're unconscious, meaning um, uh, like you're sleeping, clearly sleep is very uh, deeply involved in the consolidation of memories. There's a lot of research on this. Um, and in, during certain types of sleep, we play back experiences we've had and we can consolidate memories. I don't think you can learn anything factual during sleep. I don't think there's any way you can just uh, during sleep figure out, oh, you know, um, uh, now solve some problem in my engineering problem or something like that. Uh, I mean, I can't, I can't, I can solve problems I've already collected, but I can't build new models of things in some sense. I can't, without experience, I can't, I can't just intuit what's inside of a, inside of a building. I have to go in there to see it. I can't just, Think about it unconsciously. Um, I can imagine based on other experiences. So I think I think a couple just try to. It's it's not a, I'm I'm it's not a topic I think a lot about. But the two answers I add are, again are there are things we know that we've learned, but we just don't know we know them. Um, just 
We just don't know it. Um, and there's things uh, we don't really learn. I don't believe we learn too much when we're unconscious, but we do do a lot of memory consolidation. Uh, that's, that's known that things you've experienced, you can, the brain figures out how to store them more permanently while during sleep. Um, that's well known. But beyond that, I have no other thoughts on the matter. I'm sorry. So we have a question from Elena Tugusheva, who's um, from Russia originally, now in, based in New York. Um, Elena, would you like to ask your question? Uh, good morning. I'm super excited about the session. And Jeff, I was following you since the high school. Once I read the article about the um, hand uh, size computers. So it's <laughs> an important session for me. So the question would be related to cortex. Um, according to you and many studies, the neocortex is an engine of intelligence. But does it really measure um, intelligence? Because, for example, mammals, we are the only one who have cortex. But what about birds, for example, parrots and ravens, um, which uh, can also plan, collect information, perform logic and be as intelligent as chimpanzee, despite even the size of the brain, uh, like 10 grams versus 400 grams. And it seems that the uh, co cognition is equal in mammals and birds are equal. And brain of the birds is more complex, uh, for example, and better design than mammal um, brain design. It's have more neurons and it's act faster. So the question would be how some species without cortex can perform the same intelligence as mammals with cortex? Yeah. And why species without cortex have a better brain design than us? So uh, it's great. And I agree with you. I mean, birds are smart. Um, the evidence we have right now is that um, the, these, modeling, these modeling abilities, uh, we talked about how the, uh, the brain learns to model the world. Um, these evolved a very long time ago. Um, that is, I mentioned earlier that as soon as animals started having to move around the world, they had to have a model of the world. Otherwise, how would they know how to move? And, um, the, and what we speculated was that the mechanisms that evolved in these older parts of the brain, not the neocortex, but the entorhinal cortex and so on, in, 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 if you look at a mammal species, have now been reused, continued to be used in the cortex. The evidence we have from birds, birds have, um, they don't have a cortex, but they have structures which look like they're doing the same thing. That is the same neural mechanism there. These, in bird brains, they have these things called blobs. Literally, they're called blobs because they, they um, but, but I've, I've talked to some uh, bird researchers, brain bird researchers about this, and they've, they've come to me about that. They see the same type of neural structures, but just, just organized differently. Um, and so my best guess, and, and there's a, increasing amount of evidence for this is that birds use the same mechanism. They don't have a neocortex per se. So maybe what we shouldn't say is that you need to have a neocortex to be intelligent, which I didn't say, but neocortex is one is sort of the latest instantiation of this basic idea. Um, it exists in the entorhinal cortex. It exists in bird brains. It exists in the neocortex. It's all about model building. And, um, um, and birds can be very smart. Uh, birds, I would argue, are not as smart as humans. I mean, they don't, it just like a, a rat isn't as smart as a human, but they can be very clever and they can understand things and they can solve problems. Um, but their, you know, their world knowledge of the world is limited. Um, but I think they, I actually think their brains do work on the same mechanisms. Um, they're just packaged differently in there. Uh, so, um, so I think that's it, it's and the evidence is uh, we're, we're gaining is suggesting that. Thank you. So you're discovering you've got a fan club already in the, in the world of architecture. <laughs> uh, there's another qu question. I'm going to invite Matt Gorbe to ask his question. Matt's a, a graduate of MIT Media Lab, currently actually one of our doctoral design students at FIU. Uh, Matt, do you want to ask your question? Uh, certainly. I'm, I'm also, I have to say, a huge fan, and I've been looking forward to this to this uh, conversation. I, I actually... Uh, um, there's a lot of things that are kind of bringing up memories here. I, I spent a lot of time in the Bay Area. I used to work at, at Xerox Park after I left the Media Lab, and and spent a lot of time in your in your stomping grounds. And I was I owned the first uh, U.S. Robotics Palm Pilot, and, oh, and all of the other ones until <laughs> version five, and the, the no keyboard and all the stuff. It was a big, big, big thing. And in fact, I've been teaching um, prototyping, and and when we teach prototyping, we always pull up your, the example. I don't know if it's apocryphal. I'm interested in the example of your. Um, the wooden block carrying it around in your shirt that everybody always talks about that you walked around with a wooden block. Yeah, I, 
And I can tell that's a funny not my story. question, but it's okay. <laughs> I can tell a funny story about that. <laughs> Maybe, uh, okay. Oh, well, let me ask my question first. You can decide. Yeah. Which yeah. One answer. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so given all that and the, the question, I, I, I'm really, um, your, your, your approach really appeals to me. And I think this idea of all the different parts of our brain sort of doing the same thing, but with different inputs and therefore being sort of the same mechanism. Um, I, I really, I'm interested in building a bridge between some earlier research, um, particularly the work of, of Rodney Brooks and the sub, sort of subsumptive models. And he wrote a book, he wrote a paper I'm sure you're familiar with in, in 1991 around, um, you know, he, he called it uh, intelligence without representation. And he was kind of trying to make this maybe provocative argument that we don't need models and use the world as a model and all that kind of stuff. And of course, Brooks in the past 20, 30 years has gone even further with all kinds of great, wonderful inventions. Um, and I know that hybrid models in computing, like sort of a top-down model-based plus a, a, a lower-level sort of, you know, mechanism-based kind of come together. And I'm trying to understand what's happened since then and if you could maybe bridge that to your theory. Boy, man, that's a good, uh, you know, I think I read that paper many years ago, but I can't, I'm trying to remember it now. Oh, my God. I, uh, and so I, I'm going to have to ask a little bit of a pass on this one because I just okay. am not up on this theory. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I, I think the argument back then – but I, I'm, I'm sketchy about this was that, you know, the world itself is the model you can. And so you don't have to store knowledge about the world because the world stores it for you or something like that. Um, yeah. My, uh, my impression of it at the time, my, my, my impression of it is that he was saying, and it may be just that the, the ability to make computer models at that time was so primitive that they were getting better results for very simple navigation with robots yeah. by simply connecting sensors. Yeah, right, to right. Okay, oh, great. I think that's right. And there's a lot of very simple animals in the world that don't do much thinking and still can do things. Um, uh, but they're pretty limited. And and so I think, you know, it, there's been a long history of AI. So I'll, I'll, I'll broaden this question out a bit. There's been a sure. long history of AI about um, about under, how, does, how do you give a system knowledge about the world? Basic knowledge, you know, uh, simple things, uh, knowledge that a five-year-old has. And people have made various attempts in, in figuring out how to put this knowledge into AI systems, and they failed. It's incredibly difficult. They would make lists of things, and they try to encode it, and, like, you know, balls bounce, and gravity does this, and none of it works. And so then there was a bit of a backlash to that idea. Like, well, let's just not do that um, because we can't figure out how to do it, so maybe we can do something that doesn't require knowledge. And today's AI, by the way, doesn't have world knowledge either. I mean, we talked about AlphaGo earlier. It knows about Go in some way, but doesn't know about anything else, right? It doesn't know about, you know, that, you know, anything. And so what we're arguing here is that uh, it's still really important to have this knowledge in, in the AI system. And, and we need to have basic knowledge about the world. And the way we learn that is through movement. Um, and we use these certain types of mechanisms that we've outlaid and I wrote about in the book. So I think there's a business swing going back and forth here about, um, you know, the importance of having models in the brain, but sometimes people were rejecting it because they couldn't figure out how to get it to work. Now we know the basics, now we know how it works. Um, and so there's no reason to reject it anymore. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I, I, don't, I don't agree with that anymore. I mean, if you think about it, if you're, if you're an architect, think about how much you do without just on paper or just on your computer, you don't have to actually be out in the world. Like you, you have, you can build this whole thing in your head um, before um, actually putting, you know, a shovel in the ground. Um, so uh, we need to build models. There's just no question about that, uh, and we do. And the fact that you know you and I can be even having this conversation about things we we're not even looking at together tells us that uh, we have models. You talked about some of my earlier products, you know, the wooden model. I know what you're talking about, and you know what I'm talking about. So there we go. We have a model. Right. So here's my quick story about the wooden model. I thought it was funny. I, hear I, that, did, yeah. I did do this. I did build this wooden model. And, and architects may appreciate this because I wanted to know what it felt like to live with a, a small pocket-sized computer. Uh, and, um, and so I, I wanted to carry it around and I wanted to use it during the day. So we would, we would print out screenshots on it and I would flip through those screenshots and pretend they were, you know, they were actually, I was actually using this thing and felt, what did it feel like? Um, and it really made a difference uh, doing this. So, but the funny story is many years later, I was being interviewed by some people from the Smithsonian Institute, the, the museum. And um, they came to my office and they were asking me about the model. So I just took it out of the drawing, put it up, I put it on the table and they were like, yes, I says, you're touching it? 
And I said, yeah. He said, no, you probably shouldn't touch that anymore. You know, you should put it in a sealed bag, you know. And, <laughs> and um, so it actually is, it's actually now, it's a, it's a prominent feature in the Computer History Museum, which is in, uh, it's, it's in Silicon Valley. It's really a lovely museum. It's such an important piece of, <laughs> of teaching prototyping. So I thank you for that. I thank yeah, you for yeah, that. yeah, yeah. That was, uh, yeah, <laughs> was pretty funny. I made, I made it in like one evening in my garage. You know? <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, much. Sure, sure, so um we have a question from Aya Riyad who's uh fr originally from Egypt but now in Dubai. Aya, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you, Neil. And thank you so much, Jeff, for being here with us. Uh, I'm currently halfway through your book. As Neil mentioned, it's very accessible. So thank you so much for that. Um, so my question is, if we view the cortical columns in the neocortex as this basic unit of intelligence that gets repeated in our brain uh, using the same mechanism to learn and process different uh, aspects and concepts in our world, uh, and I think in one of your previous talks you've mentioned that we may know enough to basically start simulating it or find ways to build it computationally and engineer it, uh, could this built intelligence system then be said to have some sort of general AI capabilities or could it be a step towards achieving uh, general AI? Uh, well, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you. And I'm curious to know what's behind you in this picture. That's interesting. Um, um, uh, yeah, we do. We're, in fact, my team right now, we have a, a team of engineers uh, who are actually implementing this right now. We're building these things. Um, uh, I don't know how long it will take before we reach certain levels of performance, but um, we do know enough to build this now. And uh, we're starting down that path. Um, I think, you know, the term artificial general intelligence, use general intelligence, it's a, it's a term that needs definition because it means different things to different people. Um, um, I think we're going to go down, and, and I wrote in the, maybe you haven't gotten to this part in the book yet, but in the second section of the book, I talk about the how this is going to progress. Um, but we'll, we will start building machines that work on these principles, uh, I think, in a matter of just a few years here. I mean, we're building them now. So, um, but they won't be super general intelligence at the time. You know, we'll be happy just to get a system that, you know, is equivalent to you know, some very basic uh, uh, robotics or, you know, smarts of a rat or something like that, right, <laughs> to start with. But, um, but we're on that path. And I think it's, in some sense, um, inevitable. Uh, it, there's no technical reasons we can't build machines that are smarter than humans or faster than humans. Um, they won't be humans. I want to make that point. We're not interested in building systems that are uh, emotionally like humans or have human-like feelings or human-like issues. They're just systems that are very good at modeling the world. And uh, you can think of maybe like uh, if you're start, you know, like a Spock in the old Star Trek films or something like that. Um, but we are going down that path, and I believe this century, but when we exit this century, um, this technology is going to be dominant. It will be, it'll play the same sort of uh, central role that uh, computing technology played in the last century um, in sort of transforming society. Uh, so if the question is, can we build this stuff? Yes. Are we building it? Yes. Is it going to happen? Yes. Is it going to lead to really, really smart machines? Yes. Um, we can talk about the risks of that. Um, but um, all that's happening, it's, I, to my point of view, it's not a, a theoretical possibility now. It's, it's, it's something we can do um, uh, if we choose to do it. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I, I don't know if you wanted to tell, tell Jeff what's in the background, Aya, in your... <laughs> that's just one of my projects. It's, it's a plaster model and a lycra fabric uh shell basically was it, what, what, was it part of a building uh no it's just a prototype <laughs> uh, a prototype of something that does that have a function uh it's basically a shell like structure so it, it was made using uh different lycra fabrics that were stitched together and then some plaster you basically pour it, it in okay uh, yeah, I'm just curious. It had a function. It looks like it's about to eat you or something. <laughs> it's like a big mouth. About it. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Aya. Yeah. We, we, uh, the, uh, we have these things called, we call them proto -market. At least some of us call it proto-architecture. They're little studies that could eventually lead into a building, but they're done as small-scale studies. We yeah. have a question from um, uh, Manos. Uh, Manos is from Greece. 
currently a professor at Florida Atlantic University in Fort Lauderdale. Manos, would you like to ask your question? Thank you, Neil. Good morning, Jeff. Thank you. It's great having you with us. Um, so I want to go back to the, the, the architecture of the cortical columns and your, you know, your, the first part of the, of the talk. And, and I was wondering if, if we have any information on what the connection is between the alignment of the output from each one of the 150,000 cortical columns and how their respective models affect the registration of conscious awareness. I, I think clearly each one of these cortical columns is working and they contribute to, to our, 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 our perception of the world. But I wonder if they're not always in agreement, does this impact the awareness of an experience even though we are living it? Um, I was thinking, for example, from, from, for the um, moments where our brain needs to compensate for distorted reality based on its prior model of it. For example, the uh, Adelson checkerboard image where um, you know, it seems to trick our senses, you know, but we do register the gestalt effect of the checkerboard, even though we don't really identify the individual colors on it. I was wondering if you could maybe speak to that. So, um, so um, I, I need a little bit more clarification, clarification of the question, because I think you're asking, do we know enough about how they connect to each other to explain what we're conscious of or what we're not conscious of? But then I'm not sure if that was the question. It's, in, in a sense, yeah. Okay, well, I, I can answer that question. Um, so we have a theory about this. It's just a theory. Um, so as I said earlier, uh, we're not aware of some of our neural activity and we're aware of others. Well, what's the difference? Um, there are many um, philosophers who think that consciousness is, is, you know, there's something magical about it. Like, well, how come? Uh, I have a whole section in the book about a chapter in the book about consciousness. And I don't think it's, it's, it's difficult to understand, or at least I don't think it's um, uh, beyond understanding, uh, quite simply, um, I make the um, I make the uh, 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 I give several examples in the book about uh, how consciousness is is related to memory. That is, if I it, to be to say you are conscious of something, like I said, oh, we do you remember what you had for breakfast this morning, Amanos, and you say, yes, I do. Well, okay, so, but but that requires some memory. And if I said if I could erase that memory. And that there was, I could bring your brain back to the state it was this morning. And I said, what did you have for breakfast this morning? You said, well, I haven't had breakfast. And I said, yes, you did. And you said, no, I haven't. I, I'm sure I've never had breakfast because I've erased that from your head, right? Not just what you had, but even that you time up. And, and so there's, I, I worked through some examples like this, but basically you can show that what you think you're conscious of requires, requires that you have a memory of both what you did or what you thought. You just have to have memories of, your, of what was going on in your head at some point in the past. And if you, do, if you don't have it, then you'll say you weren't conscious of that. Um, and so that's one point about this. Um, and, and so the question then is, you know, we have this part of our brain called the hippocampus, which, which stores these episodic memories when, when we things we just did or recently did or, or, you know, just recent experiences and so on. We store them there. They don't stay there for long. We'll forget, like, if I asked you what you had for breakfast three days ago, you won't be able to, or four days ago, you can't, probably can't tell me. Um, or at least a week ago, but but um, but so the, the, it's like a temporary buffer there of things that your recent experiences, and and so what consciousness is very much tied up in in having those recent experiences and and being able to recall them and say yes I do remember I did this. Now information has to get from one part of the cortex to that memory for these to be stored. If, if if it can't get there physically, if there's an experience in the cortex that can't get to the episodic memory, then you won't be conscious of it. You just not be able to recall it. You won't be able to say anything about it. You just will just have no knowledge it ever happened. But if it got there, then you can say, yes, I, had, I did do that. I know I did that and tell me about it. So the connectivity in the brain tells you a lot about this. And uh, I didn't write this in great depth, but in the book, I talk about these voting between these columns. And there's certain neurons that send signals long distances in the brain. And um, most of the neurons are more local. But if I, but, but, Part of the theory is that these long distance connections are how the columns vote, it's what they reach for an agreement. And they're, because they're long distance, you can store them and you can recall them. And so we're only conscious of the parts of the, the, of the world that are stable because, or we're not conscious about a lot of our input because it doesn't reach there, it just doesn't get there. I can't recall it again. Um, there's no memory of it. Um, but if there is a memory of it and I can recall it, then I'll be conscious of it. So I'm not sure, again, if I answered your question, but I answered, I think I answered the, the part of it that I clarified with you. I tried at least, at least tried to answer. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. 
Jeff, you're becoming conscious now, hopefully, of your fan club in the world of architecture. <laughs> I've got another, another question that comes from, from the live stream um, from someone, uh, I think it's Janine J. Uh, Label. And she says, uh, hi, Professor Jeff, it is a great pleasure. I've read your book, really refreshing and, and heuristic. Uh, I have two questions um, derived from the book. The first question is this. Uh, you mentioned the established reference frames or models in the brain for solving certain problems, mathematics, etc., and, and that they can be good or bad. Can you elaborate more on how to concretely evaluate if a reference frame is a good or <laughs> models of some sort of evaluation? Oh, gosh, I wish. Um, so this for others, let me just re, re, uh, explain what, what the question's about. Um, um, as we talked earlier, we can learn about things that we haven't personally experienced and, and therefore we can form models that are incorrect. Um, and we can also form models that are different based on what pieces of data you have. So in the book, I gave an example of historical facts. And I could say, if I teach these historical facts in a timeline, you'll build one model of it. <clears throat> If I teach these historical facts on a globe or map, you'll learn a different model and you'll make different inferences and different you know, conclusions based on you know, proximity time versus proximity in space on a map. And so both could be valid models of these historical facts, but they're gonna be different. Um, so the, the point of that exercise is to say that even the reference frames themselves can be different under, for different people. And so we can look at the same facts, arrange them in, in a reference frame, the reference frames are different, therefore we reach different conclusions. We have different beliefs about the same facts. Um, and then the question is a very relevant one. Is, is there some way of evaluating um, the validity of our knowledge or validity of our reference frames? Uh, and you know, unfortunately in the world today right now, we see these huge disparities in beliefs in the world. Um, it's a real it's some sense of crisis right now. Um, so it's a very relevant question. <clears throat> and the answer is, is um, is pretty straightforward, um, but very difficult to implement. Uh, the answer is that we need to seek out uh, evidence that does not support our beliefs. Um, that's what the scientific method is, is to say, well, I have a theory. Don't just look for things that support it. Look for the things you can find that would invalidate the theory. That's more important um, because that's the certainty. If you can find something that invalidates your theories, it's wrong. You can find something to support your theories. It may not be right. Your theory might still be wrong. Um, so, you know, we should all be doing this. We should all be seeking um, uh, uh, other opinions, other ideas. Doesn't mean we're going to accept them, but if everyone did that, then we could, then we could reach a in theory. We could reach a, a consensus about here's the only thing that makes sense that we, all the experiences we've had, these are the only things that make sense. Uh, these must be the correct answer. Unfortunately, human nature is not to do that. Human nature is to confirm our biases. Um, is to is to look for things that support what we believe, and ignore things that we don't uh, believe. And uh, and social media, of course, has made this much worse, as we all know, uh, recently. So um, I think that's a great question. It's a very bothersome and troublesome thing for humanity, and um, uh, we're going to have to come to grips with it. And I don't have anything more to say about it at the moment. Okay, but there's there's a second uh, there's a second follow up question from Janine. The second question is. What is the state of the art computation? What are the state of the art computational techniques trying to imitate or reconstruct the prediction and model building system process, model building process inside the brain? What are the state of art computational techniques trying to imitate or reconstruct the prediction and model yeah. building process inside the brain? There's several um, uh, AI researchers and different techniques for dealing with the called predictive models. Um, and uh, it's, not, it's not what I'd say a uh, complete mainstream. It's not like the, the core of AI today, uh, but there are uh, numerous approaches to doing this. Um, I think, um, and so I, I can't, I'm not gonna try to review them here, uh, pretty technical. I think the one thing that I think is missing in almost all of these is the action component, um, and which is what we're focusing on in our research. Um, so, uh, which is like, prediction we shouldn't just you know we need to learn through movement and we need to be able to predict through movement as well uh, whether we're moving our eyes or fingers or bodies or so on um so i would say today there's growing awareness of the of the need for predictive models in ai there are numerous techniques that people are implementing none of them are mainstream none of them really um, solve great problems yet um they're sort of research topics 
And um, we're trying to change that. We're trying to go from our research into real sort of uh, real world um, valuable technology, um, but it's not there yet. So um, I, I would say that gives you a, a bit of a flavor of it. Generally, people are many, many people are aware of the benefits of predictive models. Um, there is a few approaches to it, but most of them are very weak. I would say um, essentially motor prediction with kind of work we're doing, I think it's going to be the answer and it's the center of it. Um, and I'd say, we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the process of building these um, ourselves, my team. Um, uh, and we're hoping to gain a lot of other people doing the same work, but it's, pretty, it's still pretty early on. Uh, so we have a question from Daniel uh, Escobar in the chat. Daniel is a is an is an artist is an architect who uses AI a lot. is quite advanced. Um, Daniel's question is: um, with advances in Neuralink and the possibility of enhancing brain functions, do you see this as a way to evolve cognitive abilities for humans, or is there some limitations to how brains adapt to these these types of external signals? And then is a follow up the question. And is this something that brings up ethical questions as to how we should deal with intelligence enhancements if this becomes a new possibility? Yeah, yeah. Well, for those who don't know, maybe some people haven't heard of Neuralink. Neuralink is a company that's uh, trying to create um, brain implants um, to do two way communication between brains and other things uh, like machines and computers. Um, and um, so the, the, one of the ideas there is like, oh, well, we could, you know, have a, you know, our, we could extend our brain by, you know, sending a billion wires out of it into a computer and then the computer enhance ourselves. Um, so, um, and then there's, there's other things. I, I have actually an entire chapter in the book about this. Um, but uh, I, first of all, I think these technologies, like extending the brain like that, are really, really complex. Um, they're not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, I don't think, you know, most people are going to want to be going to open brain surgery or even just stick to these probes in their head. Um, um, and I actually, and I make the, the surprising argument perhaps that I don't think you'd even like the result, uh, even if it worked. <laughs> that is, I won't, I won't go through that argument here unless someone really wants me to go through it. Um, but um, so I don't think that's going to happen in any sort of broad scale framework uh, going forward. I think the ethical concerns that I think are really relevant are that will become relevant are that uh, genetic engineering is progressing amazingly fast and um, it will be possible to essentially design our genetic code of a species or modify our own in, in um, any way we want. So we want to have a child and we want to edit their DNA. This will be possible. Uh, it, the technique is already here to do this. So it's really just a question of ethics. Um, and so I think from an ethical point of view, if we want to think about, oh, uh, do, it, you know, do we want to improve our intelligence or improve ourselves as a species or improve us as individuals, that will be the way that it's going to happen if we decide we want to do that. Um, and um, I won't give away my, my, um, my belief about that, but I, I do think we have to, uh, and in the very end of my book, I, I, I talk extensively about what is the goal of being a human? What is the goal of humanity? What, you know, what would our ultimate goal be? I mean, we, we have to survive every day, individuals, but do, can we think about what, we, what is the purpose of our existing on this planet? And, and you know, in the end game, what would we like to leave behind when we're gone? And, um, and so I have a chapter called, um, uh, Intelligence versus genes, I think it is, um, genes versus intelligence, where I argue that uh, humanity is really defined by our intelligence and we ought to be doing everything we can to preserve it uh, and preserve our knowledge and enhance it, uh, even if that means we, we do so outside of our biological bodies, even if that means that we create intelligent machines that can travel and survive, travel places we can't go and survive uh, after we're gone as a species. Um, that, that that would be a worthy consideration. So I, I, I put a lot into the answer to your simple question. <laughs> I hope that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we've got a question here um, uh, coming from Emmanuel Ko. Now, Emmanuel's in Singapore. He is, I think, the first person to write a book about AI and architecture, certainly in the English language. You also have the, the first person in, in the Chinese language here today. Emmanuel, do you like to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask your question? 
Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Hi, uh, hi Jeff. So I've got a question. Uh, I think you were referring to the chapter on genes versus knowledge. Right? Oh, yeah, I found it yeah. really interesting. I wasn't anticipating, I mean, such a kind of sci-fi scenario, seemingly, uh, towards the end of the book. So uh, it was a really interesting uh, surprise. So my, my question is that you propose that uh, um, in order to lessen the risk of uh, extinction, and in your case, extinction not in a genetic sense, but extinction in the sense of the preservation and the acquiring of knowledge of humans, um, is to become multi-planet species. Um, so, in, so accordingly, you also propose that the so-called robotic or future intelligence robots on say Mars or whatever, whatsoever planet would need something similar as the neocortex. I'm trying to reconcile or rather understand how that might actually work because it is a quite a, if we talk about, if we bring back the idea of, as you said, knowledge being stored in reference frames, and this is the only way to store knowledge, then how does that actually work out in a, this kind of a planetary context? Am I uh, be able to elaborate and also talk about the state of the art right now? Thanks. Okay, so I'm, maybe there's a few things that are confusing there. I talked about uh, people who think we need to become a, a multi-planetary species. Uh, Elon Musk is one. Um, uh, I'm actually don't think that's the solution to the problem. I, and and I, I, I point out that humans on Mars will be like humans on Earth and they'll have the same problems and they'll probably end up you know, destroying themselves. And it's a lot harder to live on Mars. I, I did make the point, though, that even if you wanted to do that, even if you wanted to become a multi-planet species, I made the argument that you're going to need to have intelligent machines uh, that work on the principles I talked about, because um, living on Mars is not something that can be done right now. We'd have to, you'd have to have things that work there and agents that, that, that build our environments and, and do our work for us there because humans can't work and live on Mars normally. We, you, maybe we have to, you know, I'm not a fan of this. So just for pointing at some people say, oh, we can terraform Mars and make it like Earth. Well, if you wanted to do that, humans aren't going to do that. We're not going to send humans up there in spacesuits for the next hundred years to try to terraform Mars. It's just not going to happen. It's too, too complex. Um, so we're kind of mixing a few things there. I'm not a big fan. Of, I mean, I don't, I'm not against having people on Mars. I just don't think it's a solution to anything. Um, but I said, if you want to do that, you're going to need really intelligent machines to do this. Um, but I do think any, I mean, to, to knowledge, we, I think you touched on a couple of concepts there, Emmanuel. Um, uh, you know, I do argue that we should try to preserve knowledge. It's, it's not a foregone conclusion. It's something we can just decide. But I argue that that's something we should try to preserve. We should try to um, preserve our knowledge and spread it as much as possible. We should try to find other places in the universe that would appreciate knowing about what we've learned and we would appreciate knowing what they've learned. And that's more important than spreading our genes someplace um, and you know, spreading our biological existence someplace. That's the basic gist of the argument. Um, and I think there are many different ways you can manifest the brain um, in silicon or other form factors we don't really know yet, yet, but they all work on the same principles. Knowledge, knowledge requires having a, a model of the thing you're mo of not, that's what knowledge is. Knowledge is a model of something. It's like, this is what, uh, this is what the universe is like, and this is what atoms are like, and this is what you know physics is like. Um, and so th those models have to be stored in reference frames, otherwise they're not actionable. A book is not really knowledge. A book is only knowledge when a human with a brain and reference frames is able to assimilate it. Um, without a brain, a book is just nothing. It's just a bunch of you know, atoms. So um, I think my, my general argument, and I, I didn't want it to come across too sci-fi because I'm not really a science fiction fan, um, is that we should be uh, uh, we should be thinking long term about preserving knowledge and about how it is we're going to not only just preserve it but also multiply it and share it around the universe. Uh, those are pretty far out ideas, but I felt they were worth bringing up um, at least um, at the very end of the book uh, about that. We're a long way from doing any of that. I mentioned earlier, the practical we're just starting to build these things. We're just starting to build. The writing software right now um, to model what's going on inside our cortical column, um, to build models using reference frames and through sensory motor interaction with the world. Um, and, and so that is just starting to happen. And I don't know how long it will take before um, that becomes a mainstream technology, but I do think it will be without a doubt in this century. 
It might be within the next decade. So did I, did I answer your question, Emmanuel? <laughs> yeah, I'm curious about, are there many bias about this idea of kind of propagating knowledge of human existence via, um, as what you suggested? Are there I don't like know. AI people who are strongly agreeing or disagreeing or well, some humanities people? Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's interesting. When I wrote that, I, I wrote it because I felt these were ideas I hadn't run across before. So these are things I think about a lot, but I hadn't really run across other people, other societies, other, you know, they're probably out there. I just didn't run across them. I wasn't aware of them. So to me, putting these down was a way of saying, okay, let's start a conversation about this. Um, and uh, so far, I haven't gotten a lot of reaction to it. Um, I think for most people, it just seems a little too crazy, you know? Um, interesting, there's a forward in the book by Richard Dawkins. He loved these ideas. He just thought they were amazing. You know, this is, we ought to be thinking about these ideas. But, um, but I think most people, it's a little bit too far out for them. Um, so, uh, but that doesn't mean, but I felt compelled to write them. So I don't think these are mainstream ideas today. Uh, at least they're not mainstream. Whether other people hold them, probably someone else does, but I'm not aware of it. Um, so I just wanted to start this conversation. I wanted to become more mainstream. I wanted people to start asking, you know, asking questions like you're asking Daniel about them um, and exploring these ideas. Um, I don't, I don't feel the fact that they're not highly discussed today is saying that, that I, to me, that's like the more of the reason I should write it because if, uh, if these are not, I think these are important ideas and if no one else is discussing them, well, not very many people, then I think it's important to bring them up. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. There, there's, just to sort of add something, Jeff, I mean, I, I actually was involved in a project, sponsored two projects, sponsored by NASA to develop 3D printing technologies for the Moon and Mars, and I edited a book called Space Architecture, and I completely agree with you. I mean, since it, it, I mean, you, you, the, the, the problems of, of living in these spaces, I mean, the radiation that you would you would experience just getting to Mars would would kill you. There's no point. Yeah. Out. <laughs> I know it's funny. Elon Musk has written like, "Oh, it's gonna be fun going to Mars. You'll be able to jump and high in the air." I'm like, "What are you talking about? It's fun living on Mars. It's gonna be like a, it'll be it's like a death trap, you know." Uh, anyway, I mean that's but, that's that's exactly. I mean, and, and that's the reason why we work in this proposal to send robots there first to start, you know, three D printing. That yeah, know, right, right. But if you're going to send a robot, the robot has to, can't be like the Mars rover where someone had, on Earth has to tell it what to do every every six hours. You know, it, it's got to be, you know, I wrote about this. They have to be, they have to be like really smart engineering, you know, managers and technicians and laborers and do everything and solve all the problems. It's like humans. Um, and, you know, we're not, we're not close to that anywhere today in, in today's AI. Not even remotely like that, but then the technology we're working on will do that. Um, will ultimately do that. So, you know, this is where I get back to modeling, you know, understanding there's things we can learn from studying humans that are really relevant here and um, are, are necessary to solve these problems. Um, it's interesting you worked in that field. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, I think, you know, one, one of the things that, is that you know, they say that you would never come out on the surface of the moon except in an emergency, which means you're probably living in these lava tubes. And, you know, uh, and frankly, if you did come out, the first thing you would do is look back at Earth and say, what a beautiful blue marble planet. I know. I wish I was there. I know. It's, it's look, look I'm, I'm all in favor of space exploration. I just think um, sending humans in their current form is um, is not going to be a very practical thing for a long time. So, so we have a question from Philip Beasley. Philip is one of the pioneers in architectural culture. He's a professor, a pioneers of using robotics and, and interactive architecture in particular. He's very, it's beautiful installation. Philip is in um, is is in Water, University of Waterloo in Canada, and he's got a, a question in the chat which I will read out. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering how your elegant 1,000 brains typology of some 150,000 distributed columns, each supporting plastic evolving models stored in reference flames, might relate to larger scale groupings of neural matter, such as the neural clusters outside our cranium, our cranium say sternum, pineal, funny bone, etc. For me, that raises the question of how embodied new neural matter works within the descriptions you offer in your beautiful book. For example, is there anything fundamentally different in an octopus's brain that might be seen continuous with its eight tentacles? 
and a human mm -hmm. brain by which a convention, conventional physiology seems separate from the rest of our neural structures in our body bodies. Wow. Um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack in that. Um, well, let me start off. First of all, octopuses are weird, and I know nothing about them. Um, I, you have these, like, apparently the brains are distributed in each arm. Uh, unlike birds, I know a little bit about bird brains, but um, I, I can't really speak about that. I, th I think there was a couple of questions here. I talked about the neocortex. Of course, the neocortex is not the entire brain. Right? It's just a part of the brain. It's the biggest part in the human. Um, but it has to interact with all these other parts of the brain uh, in the spinal cord and the brainstem and, the, and, and, and all these central structures and so on. Um, I'm not sure if that question is about how, how does the neocortex interact with those things. Um, I talk a bit about this because, uh, I mean, if you, if you couldn't understand how the neocortex works, if you couldn't understand how any part of the neocortex works, or any part of the brain works without understanding the whole brain, then, then it'd be really, really hard. Um, the beauty of the neocortex is it's got this repetitive structure, so you can figure out what the component is, and then you can figure out what the whole thing does. And our philosophy has been all along is that there's a lot of stuff that's subcortical or else outside of the neocortex that you need to know about some of it more and some of it less. Um, um, but on the other hand, on the, uh, on the whole, we're not, we don't want to try to understand all the parts of the brain because that's just impossible at this point in time. So the question is, can we understand the neocortex on its own? Um, our theories do force us to think about things like the thalamus and the antirhinal cortex and the hippocampus, and we include those in our theories um, if this is a real neuroscience question, um, and because the thalamus is really integral to the neocortex, it's like a little egg-shaped thing in the middle of your head. Um, so our, we're, we work on that, but we don't think about like, oh, well, how does the cortex relate to some part of the brainstem? Um, uh, we kind of assume that there's a body out there, that body existed a long time ago, the neocortex is sort of sitting on top of it, trying to control it, trying to steer it, if you will. Um, but the actual underpinnings could be swapped out for something else. That's the general philosophy about this. Um, so uh, the question was a little bit hard for me to parse. So I, again, apologize if I gave a rambling answer that may not have addressed your question directly. Thanks, Jeff. There's a question in the chat here. It's quite a long question. Let me just uh, try and, um, okay. Uh, uh, well, these questions are really great, but they, they, every one of them would require a conversation. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like... <laughs> there's, there's one here. Um, uh, uh, this question is a bit complicated, but please try to answer it, even if it is partly fantasy. Uh, I have a goal to increase the mental capacity of a healthy person, even if in the distant future. I'm doing my research into what uh, field of science is worth devoting myself uh, to in order to achieve it. I'm a big fan of the movie Limitless, which came out in 2011, where a man takes a very powerful nootropic and becomes incredibly intelligent. What area of science do you think would have to, a chance to make a breakthrough in finding the mechanisms responsible for intelligence? And also, can you say a few words about the role of machine learning in the process? I have just a background in computer science, but I really, I, I, I don't really believe it will play a major role. Uh, so I want to re retrain as a neuroscientist or a neurogeneticist. Um, that's a lot of questions. Okay. Well, I think I get the gist of the question. If you say increase the capacity of a human brain or make it more intelligent. Um, first of all, I, I think there's a often common misconception that we don't use all of our brain or that, you know, we're using a part of it. That's not true at all. Um, we use all of our brain. We can allocate resources to one section or another. We can train ourselves to be great musicians or great architects. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it, we can allocate things differently, um, but it's not like we have a lot of brain sitting around that we can't do something with and we just haven't enabled it. Um, you know, there's going to be some drug you can take. Um, even people who are like savants who seem to memorize a huge amount of things, like someone can memorize all the books they read, that comes at a cost because they can't generalize from that knowledge. And so um, anyway, so I don't think there's like a magic pill that you can do to do this. Uh, clearly, um, people who are, are of poor health or have trauma or other things that can have reduced capacity, and maybe maybe we can figure out some wonderful baby formula that, that you know makes your brain go a little bit longer. I don't know. I think the general answer to increasing intelligence in humans is one that I'm, again I'm not advocating this, um, but I do think it will be possible through genetic manipulation. Um, the human brain 
got large, our neocortex got large relatively quickly in evolutionary time. Um, it, it got large because all it had to do was replicate something. It didn't have to invent something new. It just had to replicate something, make more of these columns in, in essence. And um, it's a little bit simplified, but that's pretty close to the story. And, um, and so, you know, you could do that again. That happened naturally, uh, you know, 100 million years ago, whatever, um, it, it, or less than that. Um, it could happen again and we could do it. We could, someone could say, you know, I, I figured out the genes combination to, you know, build a bigger neurocortex in your cortex and make more capacity in the columns. Um, that will be a technical possibility, almost certainly, in, uh, in the not too distant future. And so if someone really wanted to increase the capacity of human brains, that would be the likely way to do it. Um, whether we want to do that or not, is not something I'm going to take a position on right now. But um, that would seem to be the most likely technology to go about that, uh, as opposed to some way of just sort of tweaking what we were given at birth. Um, that seems less likely to be uh, substantially you know, uh, moving in that direction. Well, we're definitely talking about sci-fi here, but, but this is stuff that can be done. So I guess it's not science fiction. It's, it's science reality. Um, we, can, we can modify genes now with the CRISPR uh, gene editing technology. Jeff, we have a question from Bangladesh. We're reaching out across the world. Oh, this is great. I, I'm trying to figure out the time zones of all these people. Like, you know, I've, I had to get up at 6 a.m., but that's not too bad. You <laughs> might be in the middle of the night someplace else. Well, those, those who are watching in China and, in, and Singapore, it started at 11 o'clock at night. So, so oh, guys. But Vasco's question is, is uh, oh, this question, what role does time play in the new theory of intelligence? How does the fourth dimension, how is it integrated in your theory? Uh, it's absolutely critical. The whole thing is, it, it, the entire thing is based on time. Um, and which is interesting because much of today's uh, artificial neural networks do not incorporate time at all. Um, so time is critical. When, when I talk about sensory motor learning, like, okay, I'm going to learn what something feels like by moving my finger over it. Um, that is a, you can't do that at once. I can't like just grok the whole thing at once. In fact, I can't look at something and just see what it, to learn something new. Um, to learn something new, I have to scan over it and look at the different parts. In some sense, you have to look at all the components. If it put in architecture terms, you know, I, I, I have to cons I'd have to think about each of the components in a building one at a time and, and figure out the relationships with each other and build this model that way. I can't just do it all at once. I can't just grok a building in one instance. If I want to learn a new building, I have to walk around and sense different parts and build up this model. So the, the idea that we're sensing through time is critical to this. Um, that's how the whole entire theory works. And, in, and so, um, uh, in fact, our early theory, the first things we did were learning sequences in time. And, and I mentioned that earlier, um, like learning how we learn melodies. It's just a pattern, it's a, a model in time. It's a time-based model. But even sensory motor learning, when you're moving your eyes and moving your fingers, we're not, it's not a convenience or inconvenience I have to move my eyes or my fingers. It's the way we learn. I mean, just to be really clear about this, when you're touching an object, your brain not only makes different sensations, but it knows where it's moving, what direction it's moving, my finger is moving as it makes those sensations. It knows where my finger is and where it will be in space. And it does this by projecting in time. It, the, the neurons literally say, as I move my finger this way, I'm gonna be in a new location and um, in a certain amount of time, and then I'll sense what's there. So time is critical to the entire thing. Um, and I think that's one, another way of pointing out the difference between the kind of theories we're working on and what most, most of AI is doing today. Not all of it, some AI has time in it, but most of AI doesn't really incorporate time at all. Jeff, we've got a, we've got a couple more questions in the chat and, and Matt also has a, another question. How, how are you doing? You, can you imagine a few more questions? I can imagine a few more, but not too many more. Okay, so let's go for, let's go for the ones that are here already. Matt, do you want to ask your, your question, uh, your second question? This is a follow-up. Oh, sure. Yeah, hi, Matt. Yeah, no, this yeah. is really, <laughs> this is small and it's more technical maybe, but I was just wondering if uh, you've talked about different architectures for the technology that you guys are building, and I understand it's mostly software at this, or I think it's mostly software at this point, but you're talking about motion and movement being critical to the experiments you're doing. Yeah. I'm wondering if it's related to the sort of dendritic computing and spike um chips that are going on and that kind of stuff what's what, uh, what are you guys actually doing okay can you talk about it <laughs> yeah i can talk about it so what we are physically doing are you know if you went to our office this week or like next week um you would see we're writing software 
we are writing software um, to work that, to model all these processes, but we're doing it in a, uh, in a, um, a, a physically simulated environment that has been produced by other people. Um, so it's called Habitat. Um, so that's a, a modeling environment for robotics and so on that you, it's very, very realistic. So we're going to start like with a game software. engine. Uh, not a game. It's designed specifically for robotics research, I believe. Okay. Um, we did some work with game engines in the past, but they're kind of limited. Uh, this is really high resolution, uh, incredibly detailed world modeling software called Habitat. Okay. So that's what we're doing. This stuff doesn't have to be built in silicon. Although we are working with semiconductor companies, that's another project we're doing, which I didn't talk about, um, because the, the things we're working on, all the software we're doing and the way the brain works is using something called sparse representations. And, and for those who just a real brief explanation for it, imagine you have a, a 10,000 neurons. At any point in time, maybe only 100 or 200 are active. That's what we mean by sparse. This is not. This is critical to how the whole thing works. I'm. Only, I can't explain that now. Um, so, traditional traditional computers don't work well with sparse information. And until today's neural networks, we've shown that we can make them sparse and much better, much faster, more accurate. But the computers don't work well with sparse. So we're working with some hardware vendors. We did some work with Xilinx or some others. We're not talking about yet. Um, that uh, how to create hardware that actually works on this stuff. So in the end, if you go forward in the future, there's going to be new types of hardware um, and there's going to be new types of software and there's going to be new types of embodiments <laughs> of all this stuff. Um, but right now we can do it all in software. Okay. So when you talk about motion and movement being critical, you're, you're simulating that. You're right now we're simulating, but it, we're, yeah, we're simulating in a way because robots are really a pain in the ass to do with. And everyone knows that real robots are not the same as a simulation. So, but you still start with the simulation. Okay, thanks. It's much, it's much, much easier. Yeah. So the, uh, the final two questions in the chat, one is from Paul Pangaro, and he says, can something more rigorous be offered than the model? <laughs> Sorry, can something more rigorous be offered than the term model? Uh, this can mean many things. And what does stored mean? Um, well, yeah, okay. So yeah, a model can mean many things, right? But um, it's best to uh, it's use a word and then define it, which I tried to do in the book, right? I tried to explain what I mean by a model. Um, and the way I say, you know, models need to have some sort of concept of a reference frame. They have to have a concept of location. They have to have a concept of movement through the reference frame as you're moving through the model. So it is much more specific than that, but there wasn't a single word that exists today to incorporate that. And maybe there will be one, but at this point in time, there's no established wording for these things. These are new ideas I'm presenting in the book. You will not read these almost anywhere else. Um, and therefore, uh, I had to use existing words um, and define them. So I, that's my only, you know, I wish we all had a common agreement and we could call this a split flat, you know, and then we all know what we're talking about. But we don't. So um, all we can do is try to define exactly what I mean by that word. And I did that. I tried to do that in the book. Um, this, was there a second question to that? Was it, um, I, missed, I think I was it on that one. Neil? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, what uh, what does stored mean? Oh, stored mean, that's right. Yeah, so I should um, have... Oh, okay. no. Stored in this case, um, in, the nerve, in the brain, oh, we're getting really technical here, so if, you, if those are still hanging on, patients. Um, in the brain, of course, stored almost always means forming new synapses. Um, it, in the past, these are the connections between neurons. In the past, in fact, most neural networks, they think of synapses as being a, a number, like it goes from like, you, you can increase its strength or weaken its strength. It turns out that that's actually not what happens in uh, the vast majority of the brain. Some parts it's like that, but the vast majority, it's not like, it's really forming new connections. It's throwing and saying, I have a pattern here and a pattern here. I need to form connections between them. And the brain learns new synapses, new connections between neurons all the time. And that's how memories are stored. When we do this in, in software, it's very easy. It's just, you know, basically connecting, um, it's, it's setting a, a zero to a one, in essence, where that zero, that, that bit represents a connection between two parts of two neurons. Um, but, um, uh, but literally storing is forming these, these associative connections between patterns, which in the brain is forming new synapses. And, and in software, it's just like memory that's, you're just changing the storage matrix and memory from zeros to ones. 
Um, that's what it literally means. Okay. Can we end on a question that's a little bit more high level? <laughs> well, I should say <laughs> Paul Pangro is the president of the American Society of Cybernetics. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, okay. So um, the final question, uh, well, this is actually a little bit vague, but um, uh, the, it's, it, so how important is it for architecture and architects designing? Sorry. Okay. I, I, how important is for our architecture for designing architects that the world model? The, uh, how important is the world model the brain? I'm sorry, this is a difficult. I, I, I think uh, uh, is this important for an architect? I think it is. I mean, I'm not an architect. I can't tell you. Um, I, but I am a designer. I design a lot of things, and um, I think it's important to at least understand, at some level, the cognitive ability of the person using your your creation, your building. You know, it's helpful to know that um, they're going to learn the, the, the uh, either they're going to walk into a new building, they're either going to see by analogy to some other building, like this is every other building that looks like this and know what to do. Or if it's novel, they're going to have to learn it. And, and, and they're going to have to learn it through movement. And just to understand that they're trying to build a model of this thing in their head and how hard is it to build that model. I just have to believe that would help you. Just imagining... Um, someone just saying, you know, I need to build, I need to map out this thing. If it's different than anything I've ever seen before, then I'll need to learn it. And if it's simply something I've seen before, I won't need to learn it. I'll just make assumptions about it. Uh, I think I would, if I was an architect, I would use these ideas to play tricks on people and maybe delight them. You know, maybe you design something that looks like a stair, but then they realize very quickly it's not a stairway and, and it has another purpose. And or if you want to come up with a new a way of getting between floors, well, it has to be obvious that they can learn how to do that. Um, I don't know. I think it's just you know, thinking about a human brain observing your building and walking through it and trying to understand it and understand that it has a, a, a model and a reference frame of this building that it's trying to build, I think would be helpful in, in, in being creative and in solving problems. Uh, but that's just my bias, um, perhaps not for others. But um, I think I think it would be helpful. Yeah, I've got to say that I think that knowing architectural culture, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why we're interested in your work, and you've clearly got a fan club out there. But I would say that architects are a bit like magpies, right? They they see this glittering idea out there, and they love locking into it and 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 thinking about it and so on. And this has really given us food for thought. I mean, really. True. Yeah, I mean, I think the problem is architects are both artists and engineers. Right, you, you, you're an artist because you want to create this beautiful thing, but you've got to make it practical too and, and, um, and solve practical problems. And um, I, mean, I, 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 I really appreciate that. I appreciate the, the field. I, I'm, a, I'm a, a casual student and admirer of architects and architecture. So um, anyway, I hope this has been helpful for people um, and, and useful in, the, in your thinking. So, Absolutely. I must say, from a personal perspective, I'm a huge admirer of engineers. I was at a conference once of structure engineers, and one comment was made: "We're in the we're we're surrounded by material philosophers." So I I refer to <laughs> <laughs> I, the trick the trick in design. I think is being it's just being able to span those two worlds, you know. Um, and I see sometimes what I call not in architecture but in other products, I call it arrogant design, where the the designer just says screw the practicality of something i'm going to make something beautiful and then you get and then you have the other extreme where someone designs something very practical but it's just boring as hell um and so it's like how do you merge those two uh worlds uh is, is really a challenge i used to i used to think about that a lot in my you know computer design time when i was working hand on computers um anyway neil it's been really fun i appreciate this and everyone's questions are great yeah, uh, everyone. this is wonderful. Uh, and and I, I hope that we've, you know, obviously clearly you have a fan club already, but hopefully we've increased it today and hopefully people will be consulting your book because I think it's absolutely wonderful. And uh, it's great. Thank you so much, Jeff, for your generosity. This is literally going all over the world. In the chat, we have someone from Iran, someone from Iraq, all over the place. Well, so, well so I think that's great. We need more global thinking right now. We need to be more some... Uh, well, let's just leave it at that. We need some yes. more global thinking right now. It's a sad day, actually, um, right now. So, um, anyway, thanks again, Neil, for the uh, for the for the time and for everyone's questions. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. This is going to be right. loaded onto the YouTube library for anybody uh, who wants to consult it later. And please, when you see it, please share it around. We want this knowledge to be shared. Um, Jeff, thank you, thank you, thank you. A beautiful. Uh,
Thank you for your book and thank you so much for your time today. This has been a really informative session. There are lots of thank yous in the chat and things. It's really yeah. Nice. Well, I appreciate everyone and appreciate you inviting me in. So I hope thank everyone you. has a good day or good night or whatever it is wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks.